again, um, thanks for everybody's uh, commitment to attending online and those who, who made the trip to Salem. Welcome to our fall State Forest Advisory Committee meeting um, here on the 28th of October. Um, we're set up here live in um, Salem for the meeting. Now let's go through the roster here and uh, take a run at roll call. So um, Mike Toady is not going to be available to join us. Um, Lisa High uh, is here. Uh, Lisa Phipps. Um, Leslie Shaw is here. Greg Jacob. Here. here. Denise Lofman. I'm here. It's here. Amanda Astor. I will not be attending. Um, Mike Kennedy will not be joining. Uh, Mike McKibben. Yeah, I'm here, Barrett. Susan Obermeyer is here. Uh, Dan Stark is here. Morning. Tom Scoggins will not be attending. Uh, uh, Margaret McCruder will not be here. And anybody I missed? Okay, great. Uh, Ron, I think I'll have you help with um, staff, staff introduction and it will probably also touch a little bit on um, the org chart and personnel changes. Kind of leverage the chance. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So we'll get some feedback. Yeah, so let's go ahead and just uh, go around the room. It's going to be maybe difficult for the folks we have in, in the room here that you can't see, but we, we do have a number of staff in the room, and then we'll go to the, the Zoom uh, audience here. But we have uh, two members from our, our West Oregon district. We have Michael Curran, the district forester, and Cody Valencia, uh, the unit forester there. And we have from our North Cascade district, we have Kyle Kopp, the unit forester. And we have Jody Kroon from our planning coordination team, one of our planners. And then at the table, if you guys want to, uh, we've got Don Everingham there. He doesn't have a mic in front of him. Um, he's our state forest operations manager. We've got Joe Travers, the op operations coordinator from, from Tillamook, and, and Stephanie Beal, the operations coordinator uh, from Forest Grove. My name is Bodie Dowding, Forest Management Plan uh, Project Manager with ODF. Okay, great. And then we've got... Good morning, April Sonnenberg, SVAC Admin Support. I forgot who I was for a second. Good morning, Jason Cox, ODF uh, Public Affairs. Okay, now we've got a number of staff uh, on the phone there. And it looks like we even have, I think, a number of the, the public possibly here. So let's, uh, just going around my screen here, we've got the, the time. Um, Derek? Derek Bangs, uh, Planning Coordination Unit, ODF. Denise? Good morning, everyone. Denise Berkshire, uh, Director at the Tillamook Forest Center, ODF. Tyson. Good morning. I'm Tyson Weprick. I'm the Adaptive Management Specialist, and I work in Salem. Randy. Good morning, everybody. Randy Peterson. I'm the Recreation Program Manager for the Department of Forestry. John Tilton. Good morning, John Tillotson. I'm a marketing unit forester here in Astoria and filling in as the district operations coordinator. TJ Ramos. Good morning, everyone. TJ, uh, the assistant to Southern Oregon Area Director down in Roseburg. Chet Beeling. Good morning, everybody. Chet Beeling. I work out of the Western Lane District, Assistant District Forester, and uh, representing our ground, which 
includes some Coos Bay stuff and uh, ground that goes all the way down to California. That Western Lane District name is a little, it's not very intuitive there, but good morning. Jeff Peck. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeff Peck, uh, Marketing Unit Forester at Forest Grove District. Clarissa Parker. Good morning, everyone. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator uh, for the REI program, and I'm based in the Forest Grove office. And we'll be getting a little deeper introduction from Clarissa later on here uh, today. Uh, we have also on Diane Turner. Diane, would you like to introduce yourself? We have John Walter. Um, John Walter, Young Span Specialist uh, based out of Salem. And then we have Randall E. Would you like to introduce yourself, Randall? Away. Okay, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and just on our agenda, we've got a little section here for ODF personnel changes. Um, one thing I wanted to, to share, and I'll share my screen, hopefully. our state forests division org chart uh, as it relates to myself uh, particularly. So since the last meeting, I've changed positions. So at our last meeting, Mike Wilson was here, uh, introduced himself as the new state forests division chief. And I've transitioned into what was Mike's position as the, the deputy for policy and, and technical support. As we contemplate what the organization is gonna need to be in order to implement a habitat conservation plan and our, our next forest management plan, we're going to be reevaluating, you know, our staffing and organizational structure. So we're currently going to hold my previous position, the, the policy and coordination deputy, uh, vacant as we look at some some organizational visioning. And another key change is some of the staff that I supervised um, have shifted to the state forest operations manager, Don Everingham. So I, I previously supervised these uh, positions listed under Don as well as the, the planning unit. And in my current role as the policy and technical support deputy in this interim period, I've retained supervision of the planning unit that I previously had and took on the additional um, duties that the previous policy and technical support deputy had. So I'm supervising all of the units in the Salem staff organization and the project manager for the habitat conservation plan, as well as the project manager for the forest management plan. And then due to the span of control considerations, uh, Don Everingham has picked up some of the field support and coordination uh, positions for Youngstown Civil Culture, Geotechnical Support, and GIS Field Coordination, which I greatly appreciate, Don. So thank you for doing that. But just to definitely wanted to call out that change. Uh, we are going to also, you know, later on in the agenda, talk about our Recreation Education Interpretation Program updates. So uh, that's, a, that's a specific agenda item on there. So I'll go ahead and hold on that and let Denise talk about that when she gets to that agenda item. Anybody have any questions for me about that organizational structure? Okay, not, not seeing any, uh, any hands raised. Well, um, there's a lot going on. So I imagine the, um, some feel free with the questions about, <clears throat> about the organizational changes. So we, know how to how to pitch in um at this point in the agenda we've got a spot for uh, available for public comment um kind of surveying attendees um seeing none in person uh, surveying attendees online or do we have anybody here wishing to provide public comment today 
So if you're wishing to provide comment, um, feel free to just speak up or use the raise hand function. We'll give it a few seconds. Okay, seeing, seeing none. Uh, Sorry, Derek, I had my mic, mic turned off. Um, go ahead, we'll turn it over, over to you for the AOP accomplishment reporting. Sure, so uh, good morning folks. As mentioned during introductions, my name is Derek Bangs and I work out of the State Forest Planning and Coordination Unit. Spending the next block of time going over the fiscal 22 annual operations plan accomplishment report. For those of you who may not be aware of what it is, it's essentially a report card. Uh, each district's fiscal year annual operations plan, we make a number of estimates and predictions, and this report shows how our predictions matched up with what was actually prepared. So I'm gonna straight apologize to the group here on the get-go. There are a lot of tables coming up. Uh, it's the easiest way to present these items, um, but it can be a bit of an information overload. To help set that a bit, I'll go through each of the tables and try to pull out any anomalies I see and then explain them. If you have a copy of the report itself, I've also done so in the bullets directly under each of the tables. Before I get started, are there any questions for, before I jump into the first reporting item? Derek, I'll just take a minute to, um, for the record, welcome uh, Lisa Phipps. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining. Go ahead, Doug. Look, looks, looks good here, Derek. All right. Is everybody able to see my screen or do I need to zoom in a bit there, Barrett? It looks pretty good from here. Thank you. Okay. So first up is harvest. Um, harvest covers the timber sales themselves that were primary operations in fiscal 22. There were 47 sales planned for this AOP and all of them have been laid out in timber sales prepared. Of that 47, 45 of them have already been sold. As you look at the percent of AOP accomplished, you can see that the submitted sales have come in across all the districts right at the volume that we anticipated. The story is a little different on the percent sold. This is due to two of the sales that were put up for auction, um, but they received no bids. A bit of an explanation for those who may not know how this works, once the sale is prepared, the timber sale is sold through a bid process where purchasers, generally mills, bid on the primary species of a timber sale on a per thousand basis. The highest bidder is awarded the sale. The state sets a minimum bid amount and the purchasers are able to bid it up from there. In case of such as these two sales where an auction was held but no purchaser placed a bid at the minimum amount the for a month or so to see if anyone wants to pick it up at minimum bid. After that time, the marketing units reevaluate the sale to determine if the bid price needs to come down if there's something with the sale that caused purchasers to balk, maybe a difficult logging portion that was inflating costs, or if project work could be reduced or combined with another package to make the sale more palatable to more operators. In the instances of both the DB Cronin and Bullwinkle sales, the project work was modified on these sales and both sales are coming up for re-auction in the coming months. It is anticipated that both will sell and that our volume sold will be right at that 100% mark. One other item to note on this table is North Cascade. Their volumes are much lower than what was originally anticipated. This is due to the fact that the majority of their AOP were salvage sales following the Labor Day burns. Upon timber sale layout, it was determined that the extent of the intense burn areas where the timber sales were planned was less than originally anticipated. This resulted in less acres being put into timber sales and thus less volume. Derek, I'm sorry, maybe it was just me, but the area or the district Kind of, uh, you dropped for just a minute and I missed that. That's you. The, the, the last area. piece? Yes. What, what area was that? that? That was the North Cascade District. Thank you. And so that's that 66% of volume sold. Thank you. So are there any questions on the harvest block before I scroll to the next block? Um, Derek. Yes, sir. It's Greg Jacob, environmental representative. 
I don't know if I should ask my question now or after the, your entire presentation. Um, if I should wait, if my questions, I think would go to John Tillotson. Uh, I was thinking of Ty, but he's not there. And uh, I was looking at the Astoria district and the uh, number of board feet harvested. And I was curious about two things. Um, are there any stands that are <laughs> 80 years old or older that um, are set aside permanently or, or is everything more or less under harvesting oh. protocol? And the second question is, um, do we know the RE, the real estate investment trust and the, what the timber management operations, I know that they have a, they're doing a lot of logging in the classic forest. Can you tell me what the percentage of the harvest that they're doing compared to what the state forests um, plans are? Those are my two questions. So I can answer those a little bit. Um, so to start with, there isn't any set, um, you know, permanent reserves in the plan. Um, although we do have 30% uh, of the forest set aside into what we call desired future condition. As okay. last inventory um, for the Astoria district, approximately 29.8 thousand acres. Um, are over 80 years old, which equates to approximately 20% of the forest. Um, it's important to note that of that number, almost the entire forest was logged over uh, early in the century. And so all of that has been grown and managed over the years. So the fact that we have 20% set aside over 80 years old, um, while we've been able to manage the forest, kind of shows that commitment that we've made um, to those older age classes over time. I don't have the answer of uh, as far as the private forests and how much they've they've cut around us. Uh, that's not something that uh, I've been tracking as far as uh, their own lands and, and how they've been managing. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions before I slide to the next block? Looks good here. Okay. All right, so this next block is IP accomplishments. Our IPs, our implementation plans, set an annual harvest objective that we strive to hit each year. These are generally 10-year implementation plans. Um, we're at a, the 10th or 11th year, depending on the, the district on these. Um, when we have a timber sale plan that is above or below our annual IP target, we adjust in the next harvest year to compensate. Um, there really isn't a lot to say on this table other than we have pretty much hit dead on all of our targets. Um, one minor item to note is that these volumes do include those two sales that have not sold yet that I mentioned above. If for some reason those sales don't sell, we would need to adjust over the next fiscal year to take that into account, but that's not anticipated. We do anticipate to sell those. Um, as you can see on the far right hand, uh, we pretty much landed at exactly we thought we would do over the 10 year period. Um, and we adjust that every year to make sure that we're as close as possible. I'll kind of pause there to see if someone had a question on this one before I slide to the net value. Not seeing any. All right, so net value. During the AOP process, we try to put average market values in for anticipated revenue. Um, this helps us not come in too high or too low on values. Having said that, we are in record markets. And so, which means our sales have sold higher than anticipated. Um, with the one glaring exception to this being North Cascade, which as mentioned in, um, previously, was primarily due to the fact that they had less acres and thus volume and receive less value on those. Uh, we've we've kind of gone back and forth on whether or not we should adjust our plan for uh, to bump them up to the record highs, but we wouldn't want uh, that to, we've been hitting about 10 year averages is what we've been putting in the AOPs. And the last couple of years have still been significantly higher than that, which accounts for this higher value. Any questions on the value table before I slide to the plan versus contract acres? Oh, uh, Lee, Lee, I see you've got your, your hand up. Uh, you're on mute, Lisa, sorry. 
Yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, and I, I'm sure I've asked this before and I apologize, um, but how do you um, balance your value, um, your economic need versus your board fee, timber sales? I mean, what, what drives which? So I mean, for example, you have record values this year or last year, whatever the heck it was. Um, and so how, I mean, obviously the counties need the money, you need some money. How, how does that all balance out? How, what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And how do you discern um, where to go? And I'm sure you've explained this to me before. And I'm No, okay. that's no problem. Um, so our implementation plan set a volume target. And so we have that volume target that we're shooting for. Um, and that target is kind of the, the, the part that comes first and then the value comes after. And so it's, it's just based on our, the rest of our policies and what's available. We need to hit that volume and some of it comes from thinning and some of it comes from modified clear cut harvest. Um, but it's the volume target that we're shooting for the most. Um, but at the same time, we have a number of other policies that, that we're trying to hit, uh, whether it's environmental, um, social policies that, that all weigh into which candidates we choose. Um, and so, so it's a bit of a balance on that. I mean, yes, we do need to meet those revenue targets as well, but, uh, but the, it's that volume target that, that tends to, to guide us the most. And I think Ron has a, um, a better explanation um, that he wants to weigh in on here. Yeah, thanks, Derek. And not necessarily a better explanation, but just some additional information. So, you know, as part of greatest permanent value, one of our, our mandates is to produce a sustainable and predictable supply of timber. And we do that when we do our modeling for these implementation plans on what we call a non-declining even flow so that we could manage this volume or harvest this volume in perpetuity without it declining over time. So that's that aspect of it. And then the revenues, as we all know, the timber you know, market is, is volatile and has fluctuations to it. Some years we um, you know, do better than others. And all of the monies that we get from Board of Forestry lands are put into one account called our Forest Development Fund. And those go to fund investments in Board of Forestry lands statewide. So um, you know, we have to consider investments that we need to make when we have additional revenues in, in some years, it gives us more flexibility to make investments and, and again, keep the big picture in mind that all board of forestry lands that include, you know, lands on, on the Sun Pass State Forest and the Gilcrest State Forest, a young forest that needs in investment, all draw off of that uh, forest development fund and that over time, over decades, um, that's what we use to, to manage and balance out those, those investments. So it's just not targeted to fund one specific um, set of uh, projects or anything linked to a fiscal year, it's, it's looking longer term. And then also to help us, if there is a surplus, um, you know, provide us some flexibility when, when leaner years do occur, which they will. Thank you. Thank you very much for that reminder. Are there any other questions on the, the revenue side before I slide to uh, Baker's? Looks good here. Okay. So the acres table is pretty much the same story. Uh, we came in very close to what we had planned. Uh, the majority of the changes here were again on the North Cascade District that I kind of already explained. And the rest of the changes were largely accounted for by changes in stream locations and slight tweaks to the edges of boundaries that were made to accommodate uh, logging settings. All right, moving on to TNE surveys. So there's a lot of information on this table. Um, it re really boils down to, we did a lot of surveys. Uh, this year, they cost about $2.1 million total. Uh, we did not get any new spotted owl sites. We did pick up five new Marble Marillette sites and all of those sites were in West Oregon.
and questions on T&E before I slide to the project work. Hear me? Can I ask uh, Derek, um, what did you say the cost of those surveys was? So it's it's there under the cost. I, it's right now it's broken down by Marble Marillette and gotcha. um, Northern Spotted Owl, but combined yep. together, it's about two point one million. Great, thank you. All right, project work. So for project work, there are a couple of items to note here. Um, our costs came in fairly close to what we had projected and asked actually a little under what was originally projected as a whole. However, we came in over what we had originally projected for both new construction and improvement, at least on paper, significantly so for improvement. This is primarily due to the fact that all of the improvement miles here are recorded the same, whether it's light improvement, or only a light grade and or ditch cleaning, or if it's a full width of rock. Uh, in this instance, many of those light improvement miles were unaccounted for in the original AOP reports, but the full improvement miles, like that lift to rock, turned out to be a bit overestimated in the AOP reports. The end result was we were able to get more miles of road improvement done for less cost than what we had originally anticipated. Um, and a lot of this is just as they get going on the timber sale, they go out and they look at those roads closer and they say, okay, we didn't think this needed ditch work, but now that we're here, maybe six months later, it does need some ditch work. And so we add those extra miles in to get that so that it, everything's working good um, prior to the timber sale. And I do have a couple of uh, notes below just where like some minor, minor tweaks as far as, for instance, Astoria, the road construction was a little bit higher um, than what was originally planned. That was primarily to access some shovel ground on the green saddle sale and to su support some boundary modifications to the wage earner sale. And again, despite those, we, the, they still came in under anticipated costs. Derek, would you, um, would you say that the um, uh, percentage um, on the, uh, the project cost, the, the percent of the gross value is uh, kind of representative, you know, in the far right column for what, what you typically see for costs of operations on those districts, you know, for example, um, Tillamook always being more expensive to do road work. Um, you just explained, you know, West Oregon, you, it looked like you jumped on some lower cost opportunities there. Um, but does that paint a representative picture for what one might see year after year? Yeah, it's, it, it is pretty common. Um, one thing that we have been seeing, especially on the Astoria and Forest Grove districts, is some of those percentages have gone down a little bit, um, just as areas have gotten roaded and we're going back to areas that have already been roaded. There's less new construction needed. Uh, the Tillamook district does tend to have uh, higher project costs. A lot of that's just their new construction is, it's a rockier terrain, so it's more expensive to build there, it's steeper. Um, yep. And so, so those costs tend to be higher. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's a pretty representative. Although, like I said, some of those uh, Forest Grove and Astoria costs are actually going down a little bit over time from the kind of a 10 year average. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. All right, moving over to restoration work. Um, if I needed an example, of uh, information overload, uh, this, is a, this is a pretty good one. Um, having said that, there's a staggering story to tell with these tables. Uh, the numbers shown at the top table are those that we have performed this year. Uh, we had a total of nine projects, six in Astoria, two in North Cascade, and one in Tillman. All of the Astoria projects were wood placement projects, uh, wood directly in the stream. Uh, the number here says five of in-stream because one of those projects we supplied trees and they were placed in a separate location as part of a cooperative project with the Upper Halen Watershed Council. Uh, projects on both North Cascade and the Tillamook removed fish barrier opening up just over three miles of fish access. And then the lower tables, that's seven and eight, just show the numbers that we've done over the last couple of decades. Uh, this has been a focus for the department, and it really shows in these numbers uh, how many projects we've, we've really focused on. 
And so any questions on the restoration work before I move to stand inventory? And Lisa, I don't know if you have a question or if your hand's still up for the previous one. Okay. So moving on to stand inventory, uh, this is a little shorter than what it's shown in the past. Uh, the Forest Division is developing a LIDAR-based inventory that will replace SLI when completed. LIDAR data was collected in 2020 for most of LEF lands in Northwest Oregon area. Contract crews collected uh, FIA plots in 2021 and uh, in a little bit into 2022. Uh, the State Forest Division inventory program is in the process of developing a raster-based estimate of forest biometrics across most of its ownership. What that essentially means is we're moving to this LIDAR-based inventory program. We're hoping to have that uh, early to mid next year, and that will replace what we had in the past of SLI. Uh, this is a bit of a shift from um, the what we passed with the cruises to more of a, a holistic inventory where we'll be able to get a, a better example of a, a by tree, um, essentially. Is there any questions on the stand inventory before I move to the next? Okay. Oh, there was a question from Lisa. The other Lisa. Um, uh, just real quick, are there any concerns uh, that if that moving to the slide art based inventory and, and this other approach is going to uh, result in under or over estimations? Or do you feel it will actually be more um, accurate? So, so our belief is that it's going to be significantly more accurate. Okay. I mean, having said that, whenever you go from one inventory program to another one, there's always concerns. And, uh, and that's something that we're trying to gauge very closely based on our cutout volumes to be able to see, like, so, so how is that, uh, that change in between and what's our certainty level going forward? And, and that'll absolutely be something that we key in on um, so that we have an understanding of, you know, if it's more accurate, how much more accurate, and, you know, so that we can gauge operations going forward. Thank you. All right, moving to young stand management. Again, a uh, lot, of, lot of numbers here. Um, this one, I, I think the, the two big takeaways, uh, as, as always, the initial plant is the big cost driver here. Uh, one other item to note, however, um, is the PCT numbers. Um, you know, we got, we got about half of what we thought we would get. Um, you know, this is due to a number of factors, and I tried to line some of them out uh, in the bullet just below it, um, which is primarily that, uh, you know, whether it's worker capacity due to COVID, um, just the bids came in a lot higher than what we had anticipated. And this is the second year in a row that that happened. Um, you know, we've made some changes to how PCT contracts are offered, trying to, to do them in smaller blocks, hoping to get some smaller contractors bidding. Um, but it, but it's something that we continually see. And so we're going to have to monitor this pretty close to see if this is a new trend and we need to change some of our forecasting or if it's just due to this, you know, short-term worker shortage and then those those numbers start coming back in at, at the bids that we've anticipated over the time. But But it is something that we're keeping an eye on um, so that we can get this work done um, as as it needs to be accomplished. And, and some of this we have started looking at, can we change up our planning regime so that maybe there's not as much PCT needed if uh, if these are some of the costs that we're gonna be, be getting back. Derek, are you, uh, are you drawing from the same uh, labor pool that's uh, taxed by uh, restoration and uh, fuels reduction and um, other fire related labor. Yeah, it's uh, so it's the same labor pool that's doing that, that's doing our PCT and that's doing our planting. So um, we're kind of competing against ourselves in all three of those. And uh, as long as those are, you know, if, if we're struggling to get planting crews, we're probably stealing from our PCT crews in order to do that. Um, and so that's that staffing shortage piece that I was speaking to. And, 
And if that gets solved, then maybe some of this won't won't be as big of an issue. But um, it is something that we need to be aware of and, and take steps to mitigate it as much as we can. Yep. Um, Amanda Astor is uh, kind of the leading champion in the workforce uh, development and incentives and programs and training um, here. I'm sure she would uh, say the same same thing. Um, it's affecting everybody in forestry and uh, from the family forests to private forests. And um, it's not the, not the kind of pipeline for that work that we'd, we'd like to see when it comes to protecting and managing state forests either. So I just wanted to add that. Yep. Okay, moving on to recreation, education, and interpretation. So this first table displays the number of hours of volunteer work and soft work crew days that we've invested into our recreation program. Unlike many of the tables prior to this, this is not necessarily a comparison to the AOPs. Uh, the AOPs do not call for a set number of volunteer hours that we're shooting for, but instead we like to use this opportunity to call out what is occurring and acknowledge the value that has been added to the program as a whole. Like I say, you know, there's a lot here, you know, 7,600 hours of volunteers is, is pretty simple. Give everyone a second to digest all the numbers up there before I slide to the next one. Oh, Ron, you had a question? Yeah, maybe uh, it might be for one of the recreation staff that are that are here. I was just curious to know how this compared, you know, in a, in a trend, not necessarily absolute values, but just in a trend with you know the previous years coming out of COVID and if we're seeing a resurgence of, of volunteers. So um, I, can, I can speak to that a little bit, Derek. And, go ahead, um, Randy. And uh, so we're, we're, uh, we're still actually building our volunteer capacity back up. Um, in, a, in a normal year prior to COVID, um, we would be averaging probably between 10 and 12,000 hours of volunteer contribution over the course of a year. And that's adding up all the volunteer contribution that would be happening on each of the districts. And we do a pretty good job tracking it, um, but we also have a lot of uh, visitors and, and uh, partner stakeholders that contribute hours beyond what, what, we, what we document. Um, so we're, we're still under our, our pre-COVID numbers, but we are re-engaging our volunteer program and uh, and expect to have higher values in uh, in the coming year. Uh, Denise, anything to add? No, I would say from um, the education and interpretation side, we have had some volunteer engagement, but it's significantly reduced because of the closure that we've had. Uh, prior to COVID, um, we had uh, a lot of volunteer involvement, and so we're, we will be working on rebuilding as well. All right. On to the trail project summary. So unfortunately, we're back to charts. Um, a bit of an explanation on this one. Uh, some of the new construction, uh, both for OHV and non-motorized, was miscategorized a bit in the AOP tables uh, that were put out for the fiscal 22. And I've added some explanations uh, just below this. Uh, this originally led us to showing more miles of new construction, um, but it was pretty well laid out in the actual AOP what those projects were. Um, and it was primarily hardening of existing trails uh, post Labor Day fires in the North Cascade District. Um, and like I say, I, I tried to explain what was going on a bit um, below. One item, one other item to note is that the miles of new construction that was accomplished was actually accomplished on projects that were approved in prior AOPs. This is primarily due to some of those projects just taking years to complete. Um, this is something we're looking at modifying in the annual operations plan so that we can show those projects each year 
and to allow for full transparency on what we're working on. And just to give a glimpse of the full breadth of work that's being conducted on that yearly basis. Um, some of these projects just, they're, they're large projects and, and we kind of chunk them away. Some of the trail improvement miles were higher than was originally anticipated. This was largely due to moving some of the miles that was originally planned for maintenance over to improvement um, after they were assessed. Workloads continue to be a concern for our recreation staff, and we rely heavily on our South Fork crews for maintenance needs. Short staff, we often run into bottlenecks for maintenance. Any questions here before I slide to the next? Looks good here. All right, so this next section, um, I'll just kind of go down some of the bullets. Uh, this was just some highlights from the recreation program um, over this last fiscal year. Uh, this first piece for the facilities maintenance, uh, it was just acknowledging that we're, we continue to maintain and have ongoing improvements on the campgrounds, 54 that's picnic areas, interpretive sites and shooting lanes. Uh, for facilities and development, we tried to kind of pull out a couple just key things from each of the districts. For Astoria, we did uh, coordinate the installation of some new uh, gates at Henry Ryerson. Forest Grove, we also had some new gates uh, put in Stage Coast, Stage Coach, um, Horse Campground, and Browns Camp. Our Cascade completed some post fire restoration and recovery at Sandy M Horse Camp. And uh, and then we completed, and this is actually the Tillamook District is the last one, uh, completed replacement of all picnic table infrastructure at Diamond Mill and Jones Creek. Uh, we continue to have uh, about 88 designated dispersed campsites that we're managing. Uh, we had multiple uh, trail use events and commercial filming permits, which is kind of cool, um, across, the, uh, across the program. Program highlights, non-motorized trails. In Astoria, we prepped began construction work to remove the aging 45-foot single log stream bridge across First Run Creek. Uh, we removed the 40-foot the log stringer across, across Soapstone Lake Outlet and replaced the bridge uh, with a new one. And Forest Grove, we began tread work on the new 6.2-mile segment of the Wilson River Trail. Uh, we also worked on the Gravel Brothers, and I probably mispronounced that, um, sand shed reroute uh, within the historic hiking. And I can kind of continue going through these, but uh, I think if everybody has a, uh, a list in front of them, um, they can kind of go through them. I don't, I don't want to undersell these, but uh, I kind of just rereading them. Um, and so for the OHP program, uh, trail projects were focused primarily on improving trail system connectivity and sustainability and reducing resource impacts, maintenance need, and user conflict. On that note, for Astoria, we removed two trail bridges um, on the OHV trail in preparation for replacement. Uh, Forest Grove, we had a trestle trail construction um, that we were working on, um, as well as the 7-Up trail extension. And for Tillamook, we had the Jordan Creek trail reroute. So any questions before I move over to South Fork and then the um, Interpretive Center? I'll just, uh, I just want to dwell on the, the uh, amount of material here. Um, there's a lot, a lot getting accomplished with a, a very few number of people. It's, it's, it's something I think um, you all should be proud of. Um, just um, objectively, uh, my view around the country, um, just just how how productive um, the the system is. Not just you know because of individual hard work, but just the um, the system itself is um, lends to a pretty high rate of productivity. So I'm I'm impressed, and um, that also shows, in particular, in the Tillamook. Tillamook District, where you know they've had uh, really wanted to step up the pace um, of improving some um, a collection of stream crossings and so on. I think the whole the whole district has worked with staff to get an unreal amount of work done in a in a short amount of time. So, just wanted to say congratulations to 
the whole team. All right. So moving on, uh, South Fork Forest Camp, uh, just some highlights from fiscal 22. Um, they did complete trail maintenance on 36 miles of trail. As I mentioned earlier, we rely heavily on them for the uh, fire train man days. Uh, you know, they, they continue to be critical for our um, fire suppression efforts. And uh, part of that is just getting trained up so that they can get out there. Um, forest management, this can include, you know, working with uh, our recreation unit as well as planting. Um, and then as it's shown by the total trees planted, uh, putting almost 80,000 trees in the ground. Um, and then the facilities maintenance piece, um, putting over 1,700 um, out, out helping us maintain our, our campgrounds and facilities. Moving on to the Tillamook Forest Center, just some highlights from fiscal 22. So given the uncertainty of the pandemic and significant staff turnover and recruitment challenges, the Tillamook Forest Center still remains closed uh, during this fiscal 22 year. Uh, during the closure, existing staff participated in the San Am State Forest restoration efforts to identify future interpretive opportunities, REI strategic planning, forest management planning efforts, and assisted public affairs with interpretive graphics. Staff focused on online outreach, engaging over 500,000 users on social media and served as guest professor for a university in Japan that I will not um, pronounce correctly. Apologize for that. Uh, teaching a natural resource communication course highlighting forestry careers. Uh, online gift shop sales and fielding state forest visitor inquiries continued while substantial facility repairs and upgrades were also completed. And the center also served as fire camp and two staff members were deployed at the Lewis Rock and Elbow Creek fires for a total of 28 days. Uh, Tillamook Forest Center volunteer contribution was around 345 hours. Uh, six volunteers contributed, um, assisting with interpretive and education projects and served as site hosts conducting facility duties. Um, they didn't have any visitors because it was closed and uh, they had 280 participants in an education that was that was all in one event. Uh, did I miss anything there, Denise? Nope, looks great. Are there any questions on this? Or any questions that I did not cover? Um, that was the end of the, uh, the accomplishment report. Is there any questions that I did not cover during this that you'd like me to go over? Don't see anything in the room here, Derek. All right, well, thank you for allowing me to present and uh, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Well, looked uh, looked good. I think the, um, the, uh, the reporting and it just continues to, to um, get kind of refined, you know, and more informative over the years. Um, you know, we always look for SPEC committee members uh, feedback about how how best to uh, report accomplishments. And so it's not too heavily uh, technical, but provides enough of a view to provide insight. So, you know, if any any members have feedback for for Derek or or through April to Ron and Derek, be sure and uh, be sure and share that. Um, they want to be responsive and constructive for you all on the committee. So please uh, share your thoughts. Um, Nick, uh, Bodie, you want to take, take our FMPH CP update from here? Yeah, thanks, Barrett. I'll start off. So again, my name is Bodie Dowdy, and I'm the Forest Management Plan Project Manager. And I'm going to talk about the FMP, and then Nick Palazzato is going to follow and talk about the HCP. With the FMP, I'm gonna start with FMP document development progress, and then I'm gonna talk about the modeling. And then when I'm done with that, I'm gonna share a timeline. So as I'm talking and you're thinking, what does all this mean? The timeline will hopefully kind of wrap it up. And then Nick will follow with the HCP timeline in his presentation, which should tie things together nicely. Uh, so if you've got timeline questions, maybe wait until Nick gives his presentation to see how it all plays out together. Um, 
for the FMP, we're currently drafting the FMP chapters. And once all the chapters have been drafted, we're going to put them into the compiled document. And then that'll go out for internal review. And so I'm going to talk about chapter progress, but just realize we haven't put the compiled document together yet. And that's like the final step. And there will be a final review after we do that. The chapter one introduction, the drafting is finished and it's undergoing a technical edit. So it's pretty much ready to go into that compiled document. Um, chapter two management approach has been drafted by the management approach subgroup. And we're going to be sending that out for internal ODF review next week been a lot of good work going on in there um, and I, I'm feeling pretty good about where it is at this time. We've done a lot of work on the management approach. Chapter three used to be the forest resources chapter and looking at it there was discussion and the forest resources chapter really ties together with the goals and the strategies which used to be chapter five and as we were doing some internal review, we realized they were talking about the same topics, but they were in two different places. And the forest resources chapter lays out the state of the resource um, at the beginning of the FMP. And then the goals and the strategies have the goals, which are what you are trying to achieve for the resource and the strategies, which are what you're going to do to achieve the goal. And so what we decided to do was to combine those two chapters. So currently chapter three is the forest resources, goals and strategies chapter. We think it follows a, a bit more of a logical flow where you, where you can find all the information for one resource in the same spot. So it goes state of the resource, goal of the resource, and then kind of how you will achieve the goal. Uh, we did have drafts of both of those chapters and now combining them has created a little bit more work and so that's, um, there's more drafting that still needs to be done. We've identified gaps for that and we'll be working on drafting that going forward. But there's definitely a rough draft of the chapter at this point. Um, and then the chapter four guidelines chapter used to be chapter five. SPAC um, gave input on that at the June meeting. And that's in final draft form. Um, awaiting internal ODF review with the entire compiled FMP. So that's pretty well um, finished at this point. In response to the feedback we received from SVAC, we added language to seek additional funding to avoid a reduction in management services in the case that funding levels decrease. So things like legislative concepts, that was feedback we received at the SVAC meeting in June. Um, there were questions from SVAC members about how adaptive management and monitoring needs are identified. And so we added details on who would identify adaptive management and monitoring needs in the chapter. Um, we increased the details about public outreach. If you remember that June meeting, there was an awful lot of discussion about public outreach and how does the public know what they're supposed to be commenting on. Um, we made it clear that we will be monitoring financial data. We had a lot of, um, stuff in there about monitoring. I think internally in ODF, we just took it for granted that we would be looking at financial data because we look at it all the time, but it wasn't spelled out in the chapter. So we added that um, as a result of the feedback we received here. And then one thing that I really like that the writers of the chapter did is, is they tried to give examples of the appropriate levels of public engagement for various planning levels. So um, for like implementation plan level and AOP level, they gave examples of what would actually be helpful public engagement at those specific levels. And I think we heard frustration that the public was engaging, but what they were giving, um, it wasn't being implemented, but not because we weren't hearing them, but because it was the, the complete wrong planning phase to implement it. Um, and so I think the, the writers really did a good job of giving examples of what would actually be helpful during various planning phases. Um, and then while it's not directly related to the FMP, we added a get involved tab to the uh, ODF website, which I will show here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sharing right now. Little, little, I was searching. Um, so this, this get involved tab is new and this was a, in response to what we heard at the SVAC meeting in June, just trying to give the public an idea of where to search for things.
um, I'll go ahead and talk about modeling now. As we were doing the modeling, so we have not actually begun the FMP modeling per se, but um, we're doing a lot of modeling inside ODF and we decided to switch models to allow for more accurate constraint inputs. And switching models has taken longer than anticipated just because you know we had a handle on the old model and then we switched models. There was a lot of learning to do with the new model and figuring out exactly how it worked, trying to get accurate outputs. And so um, that has set us back a little bit on modeling. And we are currently working on the revised implementation plan modeling. And the implementation plan modeling needs to be completed before the FMP modeling because we have our revised IPs for the next couple of fiscal years, which are going to carry us over until we get to the FMP for um, those. See, I believe it's FY26. We actually be planning on beginning the FMP. I should be the one that knows that. I'm pretty sure it's FY26, um, but I don't have it in front of me. And uh, so we need to complete the revised IP modeling for business continuity to be able to keep getting our timber sales out and you know doing all our trail maintenance and all the good work that we're doing. And so the delay in the revised implementation plan modeling along with the staff juggling multiple concurrent projects has pushed back the FMP timeline. And I will share the FMP timeline, just be patient with me. I have a fair number of screens open. So previously, we were planning to go to the board in March with the draft FMP and the modeled outcomes. And now we are planning to go to the board in August. And we would be asking for a Board of Forestry decision in December of 23. Um, between August and December, we would be incorporating public and board feedback that we get at the board meeting. Um, and then FM, we have FMP rulemaking starting in December of 23 and going through June of 24. And so the timeline has been pushed back. Um, and it, it's really just been a lot of a, a lot of different projects happening all at the same time. I think we overestimated what staff could get done in the amount of time that we had. And so um, with that, I will stop sharing. And um, I think possibly save questions because I think they might be tied to the HCP since they're so well tied together. And uh, all right. And uh, I will let Nick go. And Nick, just let me know when you want me to share. Yeah, OK, probably towards the end, I suppose. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nick Palazzato. I am the resource support unit manager uh, for State Forests here in Salem. Uh, prior to taking this position, I was the lead wildlife bio on the HCP, so I know just enough to get in trouble today. Uh, I'm filling in for Cindy Kolomechuk, who is our project manager on the HCP. She's gone this week, I think, at an archaeological training, which is awesome. Uh, so I've got talking points from her here, and uh, it's pretty high-level overview, but I'll let you know kind of where we're at these days. So at the September Board of Forestry meeting, we uh, presented a summary of the public comments on the HCP, and we provided some history on the HCP's development, uh, including the public engage engagement process itself. Uh, Kim Kratz from NOAA Fisheries also described the process for responding to and integrating public comment on the draft EIS. Uh, at that meeting, the board requested more information on some of the outcomes uh, presented in the draft environmental impact statement, uh, focusing primarily on economic and biological or conservation outcomes from the HCP as compared to alternative three, which was the alternative that increased uh, riparian conservation areas and also alternative five, which reduced the size of the HCAs, the habitat conservation areas, and increased uh, harvest therein. Uh, we intend to present these outcomes at the November board meeting, so next month. Uh, we're well queued up at this point. We've already had a couple prep sessions. Uh, 
Uh, staff is also continuing working with the scoping team of the HCP. This is these are remember the federal and state partners involved in the process uh, to finalize some of the more administrative components of the HCP uh, and ensure like to ensure that our conservation and monitoring commitments are in alignment uh, and specifically sort of that we see some staggered implementation of the monitoring so we don't on day one don't have to uh, do everything that the HCP says, but be specific about how long it will take us to get there. Uh, and also get clarity and alignments on those uh, reporting responsibility, the related reporting responsibilities. So we anticipate having a final draft HCP in late November or early December. Uh, but because the HCP is in the federal NEPA process, the actual final HCP will be released with the record of decision in July 2023. Maybe you could queue up the timeline now. Sorry. Give Bodhi a sec to get the timeline up. So here's the timeline for our, the HCP process and the NEPA process as well. Uh, and so, like I said, we we think we'll have a final uh, uh, draft in November of this year. Um, and then uh, the decision should be in July. The, the final will be released. Final HCP proper would be released in July of 23. Uh, in the interim, we'll be providing a summary of changes on our website so that you can all track the updates that are being made or that have been made. Uh, and then the board will decide, make it, there'll be a decision at the September 23 board meeting uh, by the board, whether to implement the incidental take permits and the HCP. Uh, that's, that's all I got. Happy to take any questions. Nick, um, I wonder, um, you said that the team is working on uh, basically administrative details. Um, can you paint a picture for us about um, uh, what it's like in the room and, and some examples of um, some of the detailed discussions? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about recreation questions, but I mean, maybe you can paint a picture for how that work is is happening and what types of things are on the table. Yeah, sure. And recreation is actually a good example. And Derek, you can feel free to chime in if I mess anything up, uh, or Randy for that matter. We've been working with the rec staff pretty closely to to sort of reevaluate all the numbers we have in there in terms of trail miles that will be built uh, through time. And um, then sort of working with the federal agencies to ensure that that information comes to them in a way that's useful for their analysis, for their biological opinions. Uh, and so some discussion around, do we do this by district or do we do this by ESU, the evolutionary significant units for the fish? Uh, feeling pretty good about where we've gotten at this point. We've kind of triple checked our numbers. Um, the relationships with the services are still really positive, I'd say, you know, a little, little tension as we get close to the deadline and as uh, each individual's agency's own needs sort of rise higher to the surface. You know, this is our HCP and now, but now it's the needs of the other agencies for their analyses. Um, but no, things are going really well still. Uh, some other examples, like I said, uh, so we have a lot of monitoring commitments in there, which are really good, uh, but just making sure that we're tracking all of them, that the feds are tracking all of them, and that we're giving ourselves the time we need to, to ramp those monitoring programs up. Uh, I mean, an example there is barred owl control. And so we're not gonna be doing barred owl control on day one, uh, but we, and it will take us you know, we'll do it as quickly as we can. Uh, forget what it says specifically, but I think it's something like within five years, we'll have the program up and running. Uh, so it's those kind of carve outs where it's like, we're gonna do this, but it's gonna take us this much time. And in the interim, we'll be reporting 
on progress towards the objective. Uh, so it's kind of nuts and bolts stuff. That's the administrative meaning kind of minor, um, not particularly impactful to outcomes. Derek, you want to add anything? Sorry. Yeah, just um, the, um, the the reason I ask was um, if there's a curious amount of specificity going into uh, the numbers around trail mileage for a 70 year plan that, you know, weren't really uh, contemplated in the initial, any of the scoping work whatsoever. And that's certainly not in the public comment phase there. So it's, it is unusual to like get right down to, you know, they're going to be, you know, this many miles in this zone on this district locked into a 70 year plan. And so it's, um, you know, I just wanted to understand better, you know, how those numbers are kind of being, uh, debated and in, in the room. Um, so I think we, I think it would have been better to have, uh, some time to develop best practices that would go in to plan, you know, commitments around, um, you know, uh, scientific, uh, practices and monitoring rather than prescribing, you know, uh, specific mileage limits in a particular space. Um, that's going to be very hard to do a good job predicting needs there. So that's, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying I have an answer for the team. I just, it's, it's tough uh, to see that working well. It, it's a challenge. The issue is, uh, Noah, in order to do an effects analysis, they need to understand the sort of level of impact. And so if you don't quantify that, that level, you're not giving them enough to really do their evaluation. Um, we have worked really hard to uh, ensure as best as we can that we've given ourselves the room we need to grow, that we've given ourselves, you know, ample room and um, at a level that everybody feels comfortable with. Yep. Uh, we base that somewhat looking back at, well, how much are we building every year and, and how has that changed through time? And then thinking a little bit about you know, we can anticipate more growth for sure over that period. And so those aren't the right numbers. What's the, what's the fudge factor that you add to that? Um, yeah, and I, I would let Dan, uh, Derek or Randy chime in if they want, but I mean, we, we've done the best we can there and it's just, we're, it's, it's kind of something you have to do to give them the data they need. Great, anything, anything more? Derek or Randy, I think um, it sounds like you covered it, uh, Nick, but uh, what, anything to add there? Yeah, I think Nick did a good job. You know, a lot of it at this stage is just uh, as we're getting further along and we get requests for things, it's, uh, it's mostly where someone's doing an analysis and they're saying, I can't get this answer based on the information that you gave us. And so we're, we're going back and then meeting with, with our own staff to see like, so how can we tweak the language so that we can give them that information so that it can be a covered activity. Because if we can't give it to them, they're not gonna cover it. And so, and that's been a, the big piece that we've been working through um, and a lot of hours put into those to see like, so what is the, what's the right way of doing this? What's the way that we can still retain as much flexibility as possible um, going forward, um, but still give the, the services, the, the data they need in order to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, one point of note, Barrett, too, and this is a little in the weeds, but uh, given your your background and your interest, I think it's relevant. Uh, we we the total trail miles does doesn't include reroutes, and so where we're in a scenario where we're going to fix a trail because of some issue, that that rerouted trail length doesn't count towards that total cap. These are new new trail miles. So that built even a little bit more of a buffer in the mix. And I would add that, well, first, that I, I agree with everything that Nick and Derek have said, um, but I would add that that we've, uh, to, 
the best we can do without having a trail plan in place for motorized and non-motorized trails across the landscape is, is to, to sort of uh, err, err on the side of, of uh, flexibility. So some of the numbers that we've provided, they're, they're, they're based on, as Nick said, they're based on a number of miles we've created over the last 25 years, they're based on uh, past trail plan work that we've done with the use community. And then they're also influenced by other work that's taken place within the bounds of the, the HCP. So how we think about the trail system over time is gonna be influenced by uh, locations of, of HCAs, discussion around uh, habitat conservation area boundaries, riparian conservation area boundaries, and and uh, and then we've also established uh, best management practices uh, to some degree, at least as best we can for trail system development. And so, as as the services are thinking about. Um, their analysis around the trail component of the HCP. They're also taking into account the best management practices that have been established to date. And then I would also add that, that over the, the life of the HCP here, um, the discussion around um, recreation management and, and accommodating uh, this component of ODF's business in the HCP has has definitely evolved, and so we're I believe we're more involved in in the HCP discussion than most people thought thought we might be from a from a recreation program perspective, and and the team, um, particularly Derek, has done a, a great job um, ensuring that there's a good level of integration around around the recreation piece of our business. Great, thanks, uh, Lisa. I see your, your hand up. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand what's being said relative to the analysis that um, you all did for the HCP and how that um, fits into the forest management plan and uh, I'm trying to get my head around um, yeah, I, I guess I'm I, it's not real clear to me how you've done the analysis relative to um, trail miles. I, I um, it, it sounds like it's not real definitive um, decision making process. It sounds like you did a look back and then some best management practices. It's I guess I guess for me for um, just just as a as a um, just as an input um, for both either the forest management plan, but in this case the HCP um, to get more clear um, in how you're deciding that would be important for recreationalists. Um, I and mean, I, I guess I don't see things as equal. I think there's more impacts for motorized use that NOAA, for example, might be a little hesitant with relative to, um, you know, walking trails, and those are not equal. Um, so I, I'm a little confused by, you know, how you're doing this. But um, maybe I just need to read something. Uh, maybe that would be clearer for me. Yeah, and we did split it out by OHV versus non-motorized in the HCP. And then basically there's a max number of miles that will be built uh, over the full 70 year term for each. And I believe there's a breakdown for anticipated percent sort of inside versus outside of the conservation areas. Uh, so it's relatively specific. And, and like I said, it's built on, uh, as Randy said, 25 years of data that we were able to look to, to see sort of well, how, what is our usual, what's our average annual, uh, you know, construction. 
Uh, right, I guess I would, I yeah. guess I would say it's been so little construction for um, non-motorized that it worries me that you're using that as a baseline um, for non-motorized. Yep, and I so mean, we, we didn't stay miles, there, sorry. That's like, whoa, I, I hope you're not using that as a baseline. Yeah, no, taking into account that we're likely to see growth uh, over the, that same amount of time. So like, it's like, we know that's not the right number. We know that's sort of a minimum. Where do we think we're gonna be through time? And let's make sure that we have a number that reflects the anticipated growth in both use and amount of uh, non-motorized trails. One one uh, one thing to clarify here as well is um, this isn't necessarily saying what we're going to um, what we're going to do as far as like the forest management plan that will set goals. This HCP was we we tried to to line it out so that we were covered um, kind of at a maximum of what we could potentially do ever, knowing that we're probably going to come in way under that number. Um, but we wanted to give ourselves enough wiggle room so that we could maneuver around. Um, and the actual numbers, the, the percentages are actually higher weighed towards um, non-motorized for, for a couple of reasons, um, some of which is that uh, the non-motorized trails kind of match with some of the goals of the, uh, of the habitat conservation areas that are lined out uh, a little closer than some of the motorized trails do. But uh, the numbers that we've allowed to do is, is pretty much double what we have right now um, across all of our miles, including all of the OHV miles. And so, uh, so it, it actually allows for a lot of growth, um, more than right now we can, we can maintain. And so, um, so to give ourselves that flexibility to, to, you know, adjust over, over time as we, as we figure out the management plan and, and have a discussion on what, um, what the right avenue is on a year to year basis. Yeah. The top end number that we're using for non-motorized trail development over the course of the the uh, HCP or the permit term is uh, 350 miles, which is uh, a pretty significant number, um, three or four times uh, what we what we've uh, developed in the last 20 years, and so we we feel that that it's a uh, it's a comfortable number and it's, it's certainly a number that we can work with across the landscape. At, at this point, we don't, we don't uh, again, we don't have a trail plan in place and we're uh, trying to provide numbers um, sufficient for, for uh, the um, analysis to take place. Um, and so it's it's actually been pretty challenging for for the group to to make this happen, and and I certainly appreciate the efforts of of the HCP team, um, and uh, and I, I would say also some of the staff from the services in trying to incorporate uh, this information in a way that allows us the flexibility to be able to do good trail planning work um, in the coming years. Um, and then the information they need to, to do good analysis work. So this component of our program can be successful over time. Yeah, and I guess for a little bit of additional clarity, you know, the HCP is not the rec management plan. The HCP is just assessing, you know, the DEIS just assesses potential impacts from anticipated recreational activities. Uh, Many of the BMPs will live, you know, are more related to the FMP and to actual implementation than to the HCP. By BMPs, I mean best management practices. Uh, and we, another big plan that we intend to develop is an actual rec management plan. Uh, and so that would be where the vision uh, really lives. And when do you think you're going to do a recreation management plan? Randy? So uh, we've just recently completed uh, the strategic plan for the recreation education interpretation program. And we are, from a, from a field going perspective, um, 
starting to do um, field-based inventory and assessment on our existing trail network. And we're starting to establish some foundational pieces for OHV trail system planning. And, and soon we'll be incorporating uh, non-motorized trail planning into that. And we're having discussions right now about uh, about uh, components and timeline for development of the recreation management plan. But I think if, uh, if Laura was here, um, I believe she would she'd be suggesting that within three years, we would have a recreation management plan in place. Um, Denise, anything to add there? No, I agree, Randy. I think, you know, the one to three year mark is we're at a place where we have a lot of planning to do um, in addition to the recreation management plan, the interpretive master plan as well. And, and I would agree, Randy, if Laura was here, I think that's the timeline she would outline. Greg, uh, you've got your, your hand up there. Um, question for the um, uh, Department of Forestry staff, uh, looking at the broad picture of the uh, habitat conservation plan, do you have a sense of how the uh, Board of Forestry views the various alternatives at this time? I don't know if that's a question you can answer. I'm curious though. Uh, no. And <laughs> so the nature of their request at the, was that September? I think it was a September meeting was, uh, here's some information we're going to need to better evaluate the these three alternatives, our proposed action versus more conservation versus more harvest, just for shorthand. Um, they, didn't, they didn't state any positions. Uh, we, ha we have one-on-ones with them frequently, but I have like, you know, as a board, a collective board, I can't say where they stand right now. And it was sort of contingent on the information that we bring forward in November. Okay. Well, say um, for the, um, for the committee to keep in mind, I, I recognize this, this discussion isn't really uh, 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 right in the center of the SFAC mission. It says because it's these are more policy discussions than implementation discussions. So we should all kind of temper our <clears throat> our thoughts, you know, accordingly. But um, it is an important update, and and we're um, like we're lucky to have a, a chance for some feedback here. Um, so thanks for entertaining uh, the discussion for a little bit. Uh, Lisa, I can, I can add um, the, if it wasn't clear, I think Randy said it, that the retrospective look at trail development was, is not necessarily um, based on the status quo, but it's also based on the rate of, rate of increase, rate of expected growth, you know, so areas in the non-motorized world, um, you know, the the expected momentum and growth is also something they're taking for a retrospective look at, not not just a baseline, you know, that may or may not be reasonable. Um, uh, and, you know, I'll just um, conclude that, I, you know, it is a weird, it is kind of a weird place to um, feel like we're a little bit playing catch up. You know, we we were, a lot of us in the recreation world, non-motorized and motorized, were really engaged during scoping and we're assured none of this would come up. And so um, we all kind of laid down instead of really rolling up our sleeves and helping with BMPs. We could have really brought a lot of partnership to bear on on, on things at that time. So I yeah, would be happier if we were in a little different place, but... Um, Keep, uh, I, I, I respect you guys are, are working hard for us. So Derek and uh, the rest of the team, uh, Randy, so thank you. Um, anything else from? Is there any questions about yeah. those two? Yeah, um, before we untie them from their chairs, um, anything else for, for Bodie or Nick on FMP or HCP? 
material. Yeah, seeing none, um, let's go ahead and uh, jump into a break since we're here. We might as well um, get that done. We, we're scheduled to come back at 1045, but we, um, let's see. Yeah, let's let's give you a good uh, 20 minutes. So let's call it 1025 back here if that works for everybody. Good. See you at 1025 and come back and turn on your cameras when you're back, if you would, so we know you're here. Thank you.
Okay, thanks everybody for uh, for rejoining. We'll uh, let everybody respond to the noises coming from their speakers at home. Um, terrific. Well, we'll turn it over to uh, Jody Kroon for uh, a segment on the uh, IP revisions. Jo Jody, go right ahead. Morning, everyone. My name is. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Jody Kroon, and I'm a planning coordinator for the State Forest Division. I'm filling in today for Colleen Kaiser, who is on a much needed vacation. Uh, I will be providing an update on the implementation plan revision project that Colleen presented back in June. So uh, I'll start with a quick reminder of why we're doing this project. The current implementation plans for many of the districts will be expiring in June, 2023. As you know, we are working through the development of a new forest management plan and subsequent new implementation plans, which we expect to begin implementing July 1st, 2025. This creates a transition period from July, 2023 to June, 2025. In order to cover this transition period, the current IPs are being revised and extended until at least June 30th, 2025, to, provide, to continue to provide management direction as the new plans are developed. Oh, should it work now? Ooh, look at that. Uh, the current, these implementation plans uh, will include the current FMP strategies, new data on forest resources for each district, additional policy considerations needed to guide this transition period, updates to the forest land management classification system, potential adjustments to harvest levels based on modeling outcomes, and potential landscape design of the desired future condition adjustments if needed. These adjustments aren't a complete redesign, but instead will be smaller in scale, resource focused, and done in collaboration with ODF and ODFMW biologists. Due to some competing workloads, we are a little behind schedule. So where we are at, where are we at in the process? We are currently working on analysis and writing the required documents, FLMC updates, potential DFC updates, and modeling. This work will continue until mid-December. We have review by internal staff, specialists, and partners that is ongoing and will be completed by mid-December. We will be putting on a public information workshop prior to the 30-day public comment period starting in early January. Once the public, public comment period closes, the comments received will be reviewed and staff will consider making any suggested adjustments before the plans are approved by the State Forester in March of 2023. This will give us approved implementation plans starting to the public comment period for the FY24 annual operation plans, which starts towards the end of March. And with that, I will take any questions. Any questions for Jody? Um, does, um, does everybody follow um, the kind of planning hierarchy uh, for the IP. Um, you know, just um, maybe, Ron, would you just, or jo Jody, Jody uh, for the, no, I will just, just, to. just to do it. And that's our typical kind of um, 30,000 foot uh, view of where the IP is in the planning hierarchy. <laughs> Well, the IP, FMP, AO, IP AO, yeah, you got this. Yep. <laughs> so the FMP is our long range plan, and I, I believe it covers 100 years. The current one does. It started in 2001. Um, the IP, IPs are typically 10 year implementation plans. This revision is going to cover the two years in between our current FMP and when we start implementation of our new FMP. 
Um, so it, it gives us targets for the next two years on harvesting, on recreation, on stream improvement projects um, that we implement on the ground. And then the AOP details what exactly we're gonna do for that fiscal year. And if um, uh, circ circumstances required a revision or, or and the, for example, a new IP it, itself, um, what's involved in, is that something the department can just write their own new IP? Right. So we did that just recently with the, after the Labor Day fires, the, um, the fires itself caused us to not be able to meet what was in our current North Cascade IP. And so we worked together with the district and our resource specialists and kind of came up with a three-year transition plan there of how we were going to uh, deal with the fires and the salvage. And then this revised two-year plan will, will be how we approach it uh, before the next F. And those go out, those revisions go out for public comment and partner uh, comment as well. Thanks, thanks. Um, any other questions for Jody or any, anything from you, Ron, on the IP side? No, not specifically, you know, just as we approach the, you know, the public comment period, appreciate everybody taking a look at them and, you know, giving us feedback that you have as they're out for, for comment. Great. Well, um, thanks. Thank you. So um, this uh, next uh, thing on the agenda, we, um, Ron and Andy and, and I wanted to engage the committee in a little bit of discussion around um, engagement and um, making sure that, you know, uh, committee members are, um, find this work uh, rewarding, uh, make sure that we're, we're um, getting uh, the department the, the feedback they need. Um, certainly, like we're all disappointed to have to have canceled our, our tour. And, um, you know, it's the first time in 20 years, um, well, the existence of the committee that uh, we've ever, ever canceled a tour. So it was, uh, I just confess to being sad about that. And um, understand it's the reality everyone lives. It's just not possible to to uh, always make these, but um, we just want to make sure there's no nothing we can do to no stone unturned about improving the uh, communication channels. The, you know, um, and so I thought, um, Ron, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about what we're what we're here to do and why it's important. You no, know, thank you, Barrett. And thanks everyone for your engagement on this conversation. You know, when the RSVPs came in for the tour and we ended up making the decision to cancel it just due to the lack of uh, attendance that we were going to have, it was just a cause for me to pause and think about, you know, what uh, could we possibly be doing better myself specifically as one of the conveners of the committee to make sure that we're getting information out to you far enough in advance, you know, to plan. Uh, everybody is busy, in, including us. So I know sometimes speaking for myself that when it comes time to preparing the agenda, you know, we're working on those typically with a planning meeting with uh, the chair and, and, and vice chair, roughly, uh, you know, three to four weeks, usually in front of the meeting. We had this particularly as a, you know, as a placeholder that had been out for a while on the calendars. And then we got the agenda out, you know, roughly two weeks in front of the the tour, but I just wanted to make sure that and hear from you all quite, you know, openly and honestly, if, you know, there's things that we're not doing on the ODF side to make this a valuable experience for you, how could we improve that so that the committee is uh, effective? I personally value what you all bring, you know, to the committee and the advice and insight you, you give us as well as enhancing the general, you know, public discussion around state forests and the, the benefits that, that state forests provide to Oregonians. So it was really just kind of a, a check-in. We had a little extra time on the agenda and I wanted to just pause and, and ask you all if you had any feedback for me 
uh, to consider or, or bear it um, and just go around the room and just uh, see where folks are at, kind of a gut check on how we're doing as a committee. Yeah, um, Dan, I see your... Yeah, good morning, everybody. Dan Stark, Forestry and Natural Resource Extension Agent. And um, I did have the tour, the save the date on my calendar for a long time. And I think some others had echoed this sentiment too. It's just, I didn't get information in time enough. I mean, I was planning to go on that, that tour that day, but I mean, two weeks in advance, I think a lot more time um, with an agenda and giving people some advance notice, I think would be really beneficial. Falls a really busy time, as you all know. Um, and um, I'm not sure who's on the planning committee, but um, if there's room for more, um, Extension would love to take part in that and could help with, um, with some of these communication issues perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, um, what, uh, I'm just gonna kind of look at my list here. What, Lisa, hi, what do you, what do you, what do you think? And we're, and we also are obviously looking forward here too, not just back at the, this tour situation, but but uh, forward as well. Yeah, right. I, um, I had, um, I was away until the 15th, so I didn't get to RSP, RSVP until, you know, last minute, but I also had it on my, um, on my calendar. So I was good with it. I was going to, um, you know, go on the tour and then come back home and um, do what I'm doing right here. Um, for me, just in scheduling in general, it would be really nice to schedule. I know this sounds, but you know, at an annual level, you know, that way I block out the time and um, and you know, hmm. that's good for me. And in October, um, this date um, was good for me. After the mid, I mean, I just yeah, I just have certain things I do. Um, and we always seem to meet during those times, like at solstice and at the best time in the fall, you know, but, but it was, um, it was enough time for me. Well, thanks for, thanks for going first, Lisa, I, I, because, um, you know, you had to suffer. I mean, I, it's not my intention to go around the room and have everybody, uh, answer like, where the heck were you? I want an excuse. <laughs> Where's, where's your note from your parents, you know? A big shiny thing in front to, you know, to tell me, where were you? But, yeah, I, I do not, I do not want to go there. I, it's, uh, I wouldn't want to be asked about my attendance or lack thereof, it, it, things I've, I, you know, so that's not what this is about for sure. You know, we, I just, we really just want to hear, um, hear from you all about uh, ways, anything you can think of for, for how to make, like, like Ron said, make this more meaningful because we really have, I can say, you know, have, having watched for some time um, that this committee has been instrumental in, in shaping a lot of how the department works with the public uh, right down to specific um, implementation decisions. It's been um, I recognize that it's a valuable, valuable to the department. And so I just want to make that as, as just as healthy as possible going forward. Um, uh, great, great. Let's do that. And then after, then we'll go Greg after that. Yeah. Well, for me, I thought I had plenty of time. It's been on my calendar for months, but it also fell on a day that I have a standing appointment that has actually been on there for years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, and it's a hard one for me to make up. Um, but the other part for me was, um, you know, I was really close to the, what happened on the McKinsey fire. And so I've already been, I, it, I put that off for a long time. I didn't want to go there because I was familiar with the area. And it's the same way with up the Sandy Am. You know, I worked for the Forest Service, so I used to make trips up there. And it's really hard when you remember a place one way and it's not that way anymore. So, you know, fire is kind of devastating. Plus I also live in Oak Ridge and um, we just had, we're still having a really big fire and, you know, it, we just got out of the smoke, just barely have been out of the smoke for a week or so now. <laughs> so 
um, there were just a lot of factors for me that said that this probably wasn't the right time to go on a field trip. So we just got out of level one evacuation last week. So, <laughs> so anyway, it, it had nothing really to do with anything that you've done. That didn't, isn't what kept me. It was other things in my own head that kept me out of going. Just so you know that. <laughs> no, great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing, uh, Greg. And then after, after Greg, uh, uh, Lisa, if you wouldn't mind um, just sharing what you put in chat, that was, that was, that was good. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, Barrett, I could not do both. And I'm wondering, I don't know the time schedule. Would it have been possible to have done the tour starting early in the morning? And then uh, we gather for the State Forest Advisory Committee at lunch or, and go through the afternoon, or is that just too, too much to try to squeeze into one day? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole group can weigh in there. I, the team can weigh in, but I think um, it would be tough with the, um, <clears throat> there's so many complexities uh, on the staff side for transportation and facilitation. Uh, that would be, that would be tough. Um, but uh, appreciate the feedback on just how hard it is to do two, two days. Um, Lisa? Oops. It, would you mind sharing what you? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I was answering probably multiple questions you were asking, uh, Barrett. But in terms of the tour, it it, it wasn't going to work for me either way. So in that regard, I'm sorry that it that that it didn't move forward, but I wasn't going to be able to attend. Two days is a little tough for me right now. Um, but in terms of just the, the value and, and the, that this committee adds, um, I might be a little biased, but I think this committee uh, provides a great resource to the agency, but then I think it's also really good for us as stakeholders to understand at the higher level and that, that policy discussion that takes place within ODF and the Board of Forestry, and then what's happening on the ground is extremely beneficial for all of us to know and to take back to our respective groups. So I really appreciate this committee and all the work that goes into it. Yeah, as we go around the room, um, if a notion of having a, a, a tour uh, on a on a single day, and then a committee meeting scheduled, you know, in some other week uh, uh, or month. Um, keep that in mind too, if that would work. Um, well, uh, for instance, since I haven't turned off my mic yet, um, yeah. you know, to that end, it it may be that what what the commitment is to that particular meeting where you have those two different aspects is that it is purposely purposefully left as a um as a little bit lighter meeting so we we in the afternoon for example or however it played out we would, we would have very succinct and specific topics and a lot of the other stuff that we tend to touch on that might be updates but not requiring any action or really any input those would get put off to a different time frame I think that would help that day become a little more manageable if it could be planned that way yeah I will say um, in, in my experience some of the best conversations we've had have, have been just reflecting right back to you know what we saw the previous day so that's been kind of um, there's, you know, I feel like there's been quite a bit of value in uh, being able to uh, kind of review what we saw while it's fresh in everybody's mind. Um, I have uh, Leslie next on my list. Uh, what do you, you have any thoughts? Not about not about your excuse for I, you know I don't want to. <laughs> you, so good there. Well, whatever uh, whatever your thoughts are about the.
last year we couldn't hunt because um, of the horrific fire that went through there. And it's amazing how much uh, green grass and other thistles and all kinds of stuff are coming back. I mean, it's renewed itself in a year. Um, the trees are horrendously burned, but it's recovering. And it's kind of, um, it's kind of like a warm and fuzzy feeling to see it greening up and renewing itself. Um, but anyways, I kind of like the tour and the thing. It's always worked in years past. And I know for people that are working, it's hard to schedule, but I think it's um, really an important part of having a voice that can go out by doing the tours because you're physically looking at it and taking it all in versus looking at someone's pictures. Just my thought. Thanks. Um... Uh, appreciate it, Leslie. I, I have uh, Denise, and just in no particular order, just uh, next on my list here. Any thoughts, Denise? Yeah, thanks, Barrett. Um, so I knew as soon as the tour was set that I wouldn't be able to make it because um, I already had a standing meeting. I I liked the idea of setting our schedule on an annual basis so everyone knows what the dates are early on in the year. Um, one, you know, this year I know it didn't work to have the tour in the summer, but um, maybe we could think about shifting from a fall tour to a summer tour like in past years. Um, I also very much like the idea of, of uh, with Greg and Lisa's ideas uh, for a one day kind of combined. Um, Lisa's right. It would, uh, we would, the meeting would be more condensed, but perhaps that um, could be a good use of time. Like Leslie, I find the tours to be really helpful uh, to get out on the ground and to see what we talk about in these meetings um, and what operations look like on the ground. To be honest, I also think maybe part of the issue is. We've been meeting remotely for a while, so the meetings have a little bit of a different feel than they used to. And I think maybe we're all kind of adjusting to what this new normal is gonna look like. Um, yeah, so I appreciate that you guys are asking the question and kind of we're doing some brainstorming to see um, how we wanna move things forward in the future. You know, I'll, you uh, touched on uh, something that did did come up with the tour um, and this idea of a one day combined. Um, <clears throat> we did, <clears throat> sorry, we um, identified a couple of places on this tour that we were gonna use as a bit of a meeting space, if you will. So uh, we actually had made the decision to hike a little ways into uh, Shelburne Falls. Um, even though there wasn't a ex real extended tour talk there, we thought we'd use it just as a, a venue for more conversation on other topics. And so, for example, we could use a tour um, and some of those stops as kind of small remote meeting spaces, if you will, where we may do more SFAC type discussion, not just uh, present and run, you know, hits, if you will. So I, you know, maybe maybe that's a place we go. Uh, um, thanks, Denise. Uh, the next name I've got here is Mike McKibben. He might have. He had to oh, yeah, he did slip away. That's right. He did mention he had to go. Um, and we've heard from Susan and Dan. That, so that's pretty much everybody we have in attendance. Um, any other thoughts on that, Ron? Or Anybody else in the room have anything we no I appreciate the the feedback and again it's just to help us make sure we're um, effectively facilitating and you know managing the the committee and that you're finding value in it. I know we certainly do and want to continue to to have the committee and uh, as we go forward with an HCP and a, a new forest management plan, we're going to be making you know new implementation plans and right on the horizon here we've got the IP revisions that Jody you know just talked about and when we're talking about planning, you know, flux, um, policy shift, major policy shift. That's always a, 
you know, at that transitional time, there's a lot of uh, different views that are always out there from the public on, uh, you know, the past versus the, the future, et cetera, and how to, as a state agency, we, we balance that out during that time of transition. So, uh, you know, the advice you provide is useful and informative to assist us in that effort. And I, maybe just specifically, the last thing I would ask is just around the, you know, the meetings that we have that are not tours, the given the Zoom platform versus, you know, hybrid, et cetera, would, would we prefer to have them all be Zoom or, or continue to be the hybrid option? Just a question. I'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah. Dan, did you, you lowered your hand, I see, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I think we'll have views across the map uh, uh, supporting hybrid or uh, um, op opposing them. I'm not the. Did you have some? No. Oh, um, um, just the way I'm wired, I'm not a um, attracted necessarily to the party, the physical party. You know, but I, I do. I can say as a facilitator or chair, I. I much prefer the body language, trying to read uh, the room, you know, whether, uh, you know, um, it's so important just philosophically to be able to spot, you know, body language, you know, we all have it and, and try and extract, you know, comment or thoughts from somebody who maybe is not quite ready to raise their hand yet. Um, that just is so valuable and it's, it's really, really so far short of ideal to have to just look for a, the hand raised symbol. Um, but um, so again, not the social uh, value necessarily, but the, just on the quality discussion. And uh, I, I miss that in person for sure. Um, you know, I do not, uh, Leslie just asked if we had um, presentation materials that uh, would have been handed out on the tour. And I don't think we have that step with us. Yeah, go ahead, um, Susan. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, we learned a whole different life during COVID that we didn't have before. And, you know, good, bad, ugly, it doesn't. It all depends on your perspective, but I think it was really an, an important thing for us to learn because what's nice is I know the last meeting we had, I couldn't have gotten here, but I was able to attend because it was a hybrid meeting. So having that option, I think the future is always going to be there. There's always going to be a hybrid. I would much rather meet in person just because of what you said. You know, I'm, I'm a chair of a on electric co-op and I really hate it. We had to do hybrid this week because somebody had COVID. Um, so having that option made it so we didn't have to postpone the meeting. That was really a, the important part. But I think this is gonna be part of our future. So having that, probably some people that are on now wouldn't have come if they couldn't have done virtual. So um, I think we're always gonna have that, but the preference is is to be in person and, and that's a nice thing and you can't it's hard to do a field trip <laughs> virtual although I've done some of those too <laughs> that's somebody else has done the the trip and we've got to be online so um I, I just don't want to ever see us not have that option because I really think it it helps for if you can't come especially if you live far away um chair brown if I may jump in um, Go ahead. So with the legislation passed, uh, there was first an executive order at the governor's office and then um, some legislation that passed. So we're actually required to provide a virtual option uh, for the public, particularly, um, is kind of how that's structured. Um, the reason for that is you're considered a governing body under uh, Oregon state law because you provide advice to the agency and or the board. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, um, in terms of what we can offer, um, you know, the zoom, the, the virtual part is required moving forward. Um, 
but the, you know, the hybrid part, um, you know, I think, it, yeah, I'm hearing there's a lot of value in getting folks in the room. Um, you know, that's definitely an option we have moving forward as well. But I, I did want to clarify that the hybrid, the, the virtual part is something that will be with us uh, perpetually, I think. Very good. Um, well, thanks for sharing uh, sharing your thoughts, folks. And um, we, how we, what do you think on timing for? Okay. All right. Since yeah, since we are we are running quite a bit ahead, and our lunch won't uh, be here for a little while. Let's um, slip our uh, REI updates uh, category up here before lunch, and. Um, Denise is going to captain that. Uh, uh, go ahead, Denise. Well, it looks like it's my lucky day. I won't have to keep everybody awake after lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a reminder, I am Denise Berkshire, and I'm currently filling in as the interim Tillamook Forest Center director. Uh, prior to that, uh, my position was the interpretation and education coordinator at the center. And today I'm filling in for Laura Fredrickson to share out the REI updates and sharing out her notes that we have. Uh, so we're going to kick it off with an introduction uh, of Clarissa Parker, our new Recreation Education and Interpretation Program Community Engagement Coordinator. And she's on the screen here. Uh, Clarissa comes to ODF with a strong background in the nonprofit sector, having most recently served as the Assistant Director of Development with the Oregon Symphony with additional experience as the development director for the Eugene Springfield Youth Orchestra. Prior to that, Calissa worked with the United Way of Lane County as the enrollment and outreach coordinator for the Preschool Promise Program. Clarissa has a master's of nonprofit management from the University of Oregon, a certificate in fundraising management from the University of Nebraska, and completed her undergraduate degree at Creighton University with a double major in journalism, public relations, and Francophone studies. Clarissa's work as the Community Engagement Coordinator will pick up the body of work that Kyle Smith had begun and continue to move that forward. More specifically, Clarissa will develop a more thorough community engagement plan to ensure we are reaching additional constituents beyond our longstanding user groups to educate them about the REI program and the many benefits that the program provides. And more pointedly, to help them understand active forest management, highlighting the fact that the REI program does not receive any public tax dollars and is currently supported through the timber harvest dollars. The goal is to develop lasting partnerships with our long lasting and new use communities in an effort to engage them as public stewards of state forest as potential new volunteers and or move them into a relationship with the State Forest Trust of Oregon as donors. Clarissa will be able to leverage many benefits provided by the REI program with the newly developed State Forest brand, work that was originally spearheaded by Kyle Smith, and Clarissa will begin building upon those efforts and continue socializing the new brand both internally and externally. As proposed in the REI strategic plan, the new brand will be leveraged in building out a public-facing website for the REI program focusing website design on being user-friendly, narrative in style, and providing the general public with information pertinent to recreational, educational, and interpretive opportunities on state forests. The website will employ the art of narrative storytelling to generate support of our public license to manage state forests. The new website will hopefully be designed to allow the program to expand into e-commerce, and licensed merchandise to further promote the REI program and eventually generate, generate sizable income. Lastly, Krista will be called upon to complete an overhaul of, volunteer, of our volunteer programs, strategizing on ways to increase efficiencies and economies of scale when recruiting new volunteers and standardizing many of our existing policies and procedures that guide our work with volunteers, which spans the breadth of volunteer camp hosts, site hosts and day volunteers at the Tillamook Forest Center, trail patrols, adopt-a-trail agreements, and one-time volunteer activity. This is no small endeavor. And Clarissa will bite into that body of work by refining a volunteer handbook, largely modeled after Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Clarissa and Laura will jointly ensure 
uh, that they complete an overhaul on their existing pro our, our existing volunteer programs and that we're doing so in compliance with ODF's guidelines and volunteer engagement. Her success will largely depend on the evolving relationships and partnership we have this, with the State Forest Trust of Oregon. Although Clarissa has expertise in fundraising and development, she'll be shifting gears and focusing her energies on friend raising and community engagement, steering folks to understand the good work of the State Forest Trust of Oregon is performing on behalf of the REI program. And additionally, you will note much of Clarissa's portfolio aligns well with the REI strategic plan. And I want to turn it over to Cla Clarissa to just say a couple of words and give her a warm welcome. We're excited to have her join the team. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, hi, everyone. As Denise said, I'm Clarissa Parker, and I'm in my fourth week on the job, and it's been going so great so far. I've been able to tour um, Tillamook State Forest and the, the Forest Center and Clatsop State Forest and Sierra Rec areas there and then I did spend some time in the Sanium Wednesday and I did go to the site um, where we were supposed to have the tour yesterday so that was just really informative and helpful um, and I think I imagine just opportunities to really increase and leverage partnerships we currently have and try to um, bolster and create new ones and I think that would definitely involve a lot of people in this room. Um, I really look forward just to this incredible opportunity and starting to um, really dive into the work. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions um, or just want to want to chat. Thanks. Thanks, say, Clarissa. Say um, well, Denise. Um, I wonder if um, you and uh, maybe your Clarissa would be able to. Um, squeeze in at some point, uh, uh, look at the brand development work and logo work. Uh, I'm not sure SFAC has had a presentation on, of the final work there. So whenever you think it makes sense, Denise. Yeah, I think um, Laura is will be doing rollouts on that. I know she has some updated information and I don't have um, those readily available, but I do know that um, that her and Clarissa have been working with the marketing team and Clarissa, please feel free to add anything for updates. Yeah, so we are planning to um, have an internal reveal at the State Force workshop at the end of November, early December. And then I think after that, um, once we have that internal presentation, it might be a good time to figure out when we can plan to present to this committee gotcha. too. Gotcha. It's close, it's coming. Yep, yep. appreciate that, That's that's right. Okay, so moving on to Tillamook Forest Center updates. Um, so our facilities team has been working on tackling the backlog of maintenance and upkeep with, during the closure. Uh, we've been busy working on a bench replacement project, winterization for the facility, and planning on defensible space around the building. Uh, it's pretty amazing what the forest will do in three years uh, for growth, especially with the wet spring that we had. Uh, we've also had some facility upgrades. We had an internet upgrade to expand our bandwidth and our facilities coordinators working with the Salem's facility staff on a boiler and DDC uh, upgrade. Essentially that's uh, bringing our HVAC system into a more contemporary uh, software program. So that's looking like it's going to happen in the spring. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, we heat the Tillamook Forest Center with wood pellets and we have boilers that burn those to run our HVAC system. Uh, we've been working with the Oregon Youth Corps uh, for some facility project work and have a partnership there. And the students that are coming out were actually receiving credit uh, for natural resources in Tillamook. So that's pretty exciting. And we have a volunteer winter cleaning day scheduled in January where we will be partnering with Roby's Furniture uh, for their community service day. And they're gonna come out and help us clean the facility. So um, really the, the main word for the Tillamook Forest Center these days is uh, rebuilding. We've had difficulties in recruiting um, post pandemic. Uh, due to the remote location of the Tillamook Forest Center. 
and folks preferring to remote and telework, just the conversation we were just having. Uh, we have some exciting news in that uh, our two frontline interpretive seasonal positions have rolled over to full time. We've secured um, funding through our fire protection division through the state fire grant. Uh, so those will be moving from seasonal positions to full time. And we currently have eight of the 11 positions vacant. So recruitment strategy that's occurring right now to fill all of those vacancies is right now we have the interpretation and education coordinator um, is on the street for recruitment as a job rotation. And then the we have an interpretive media and operations specialist and those two full-time frontline interpretive positions uh, will be out on the street either today or the beginning of next week. And then following that, excuse me, we'll have the visitor services coordinator and specialist positions recruiting together. And all of these we're doing in groups to in hopes for efficient onboarding and training. So rather than having all the positions staggered out, we're hopeful to bring in the groups in those units so we can onboard them together, do the training together. Um, and then we'll fill the two remaining seasonal positions after uh, those positions are filled. So with all of that, we're continuing to plan uh, the planning for the TFC and new staff for reopening in the spring of 2023. So before I move on, are there any questions on the Tillamook Board Center updates? I, I do, Denise. Um, you're, you mentioned uh, you've eight of your 11 positions are vacant. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, um, what you need bare bones in order to open? What we need bare bones to open is we need to have um, key staff in each unit. So our facility staff are onboarded. We need to have key staff in the interpretation and education program. So um, those are the higher level positions and a frontline position. Then we also need to have both of our visitor services uh, folks on board because those are the folks that staff our information desk and handle our administration. And um, they're really the, you know, the frontline staff that are there. So um, it's, it's not so much the number as the positions that we have. So we have coverage in all of the units. Mm -hmm. Yep, I mean, I can, um, one could ask, you know, what, what do you need? You just, somebody to unlock the door and let the people in. What, you know, <laughs> what more do you need? So I just wanted to have folks understand um, what you're up against um, about trying to get those doors open. Barrett, I think it's also important to just note that um, the entire staff, with exceptions of myself, are brand new. So we've lost all of our institutional knowledge at the facility. So it's the onboarding and training is really the big heavy lift. And we also are recruiting for volunteers for our 2023 um, season to bring folks on. But every staff member will need uh, to be trained and onboarded uh, from the ground up. Thanks. Thanks. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Paul, why don't you? <laughs> I, a question from the room submitted for consideration. Um, uh, any plans for additional uh, cleanup days out there in the forest this, this next year? Uh, at the Tillamook Forest Center or in the forest? At, at the center. Yeah, so typically what we do is we have an annual cleaning day and it's a one day event that we open up for folks. And we find that we can get most of that cleaning done in a single day. We do have day volunteers that help us during operations with daily janitorial services and maintenance and things like that. But uh, one day uh, with about 20 volunteers meets our needs at this time. For what it's worth that, that even with the center closed, that turns out to be a great uh, fundraising opportunity for folks. You know, those are 
typically people who love the center or love the forest. And uh, Denise always comes away with uh, uh, a hat <laughs> with some donations in it. So that's a great opportunity. And new volunteers as well. Yep. Okay. I don't see any other questions. I'll move on to our next topic. Uh, which is uh, recruitment challenges at South Fork and capacity impacts to recreation in the Tillamook Forest Center. So results of joint review of the work camp program conducted by the Oregon Department of Forestry and the Department of Corrections, it was determined that adults in custody crews working within the recreation program would be no larger than five adults in custody to one South Fork crew coordinator which inevitably had impacts to the REI program, especially during the high use busy season when many of the adults in custody, which we refer to as AICs uh, for short, are additionally pulled into the fire protection program. There is a waiver to the five person crew. Uh, it used to be 10, it used to be 10 person crews. A waiver is available and can be exercised on new project work that's not open to the public. However, the process is still very much in its infancy and there's still a fair amount of unknowns associated with it. So just like the Tillamook Forest Center challenges for recruitment, South Fork is experiencing the same thing. We're six miles apart on Highway 6 and they're challenged um, recruiting crew bosses uh, as a result of the remote location. So implications for that at the center, the Tillamook Forest Center, uh, prior to this change, we were able to have two to three adults in custody on site with a trained ODF staff person to assist with project work in the off season when we're closed in the winter, December through February. And that project work included such things as refinishing highway signs, janitorial assistance, trail work on site, cutting trees, painting, um, and a whole variety of projects. And then during the operating season, when the center's open, the South Fork crews assisted uh, with sweeps at the Smith Homestead and blowing off the parking lots. And with a 10-man crew, you can imagine if they all have backpack blowers on, they can do the entire parking lot in an hour and it's pretty efficient. Given the current workloads and vacancies, uh, South Fork support is no longer an option and continues to be reduced. Uh, the impact to the center is that the two facility staff who are responsible for the 120 acre compound, the complex facility systems, daily maintenance and janitorial duties, uh, which also includes three structures and two vault toilets, uh, they'll have to pick up that extra workload. The implications for recreation. So the greatest impact upon the program was in terms of trail maintenance and construction. Uh, this meant that the trails were not brushed and cleared at the same rates as years past, or that the recreation staff were pulled into trail brushing projects and away from other priority recreation work in campgrounds or other facilities. Additionally, new trail construction or rerouting of trails for timber operations or changing landscape conditions were severely impacted. The REC program built an annual operations plan, which we started talking of the meeting today with, um, and other maintenance plans with the direction and assumption of a full South Fork crew staffing, and that included 10% AIC crews prior to that change. So the reduction has already delayed and paused multiple construction projects and will build further delay delays on other plans. Uh, with facilities, the impacts of the decreased crew size were fewer uh, than the impacts on the trails. However, certain activities, especially in the off season, like vegetation management and leaf pickup have greatly impacted, has been impacted by the smaller crew size. The biggest impact has been upon shifting recreation staffers to assist in trail work or other backlogged work resulting from the change. And this has impacts on the groundwork and the ability to communicate with the public on recreation policy and fire restrictions. The implication of the change is either the work gets backlogged or it has to be contracted out, which has its own overhead costs. And this includes the front end work to draft contracts by the recreation uh, staff and ODF procurement and the back end administration and oversight of service contracts by already limited capacity within the recreation program. 
So um, with that, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any questions uh, before I open that up. I think it's really important to note that in summary, the South Fork is a really valuable resource for the recreation and education and inter program to accomplish maintenance of our existing infrastructure. So any questions there or um, and Randy's here to also help answer recreation questions as well. Well, just that um, I, and I know the uh, relationship with the Department of Corrections and the risk management decisions, you know, from the governor's office on down are at, at play here. You know, it's not something that the department can just change on their own. And I know nobody wants to make somebody suffer under, you know, criticism that they can't solve, but um, if Ron, or is there anybody who can characterize the nature of the relationship and what, um, how those conversations are going or, you know, help us understand more about um, how we got here, or get out of it. And you mean specifically with South Fork and some of the program review changes? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and also I think, you know, this could be a potential future topic um, if the committee would like. Um, and I, I'm curious how many com committee members have had the chance to get out to South Fork. Um, and I know we, we've got a few new members and um, I do remember at one point we did what we called a mobile meeting where we started at the Tillamook Forest Center, spent part of a day, went to South Fork and then ended the day in Forest Grove at the, the rock pit to look at some of the target shooting things. So maybe something that we could think about doing again. Um, so kind of what Denise covered there um, related to some challenges at South Fork are a bit twofold. For one, there's the the recruitment and retention challenges um, that we're, that she's faced with being a remote location in which we do not offer um, hybrid work schedules. And South Fork is the same way, um, right? We have ODF crew bosses with the sole purpose of their position to go up into the woods and take those adults in custody out and ensure that they get the work that they're mandated to do. Um, so currently right now at South Fork, about a third of our organization is vacant, um, and that's in the administration, management, and crew boss capacity. Um, so we're operating with, um, at one point we could put together 15 crews, uh, but we've got at least five crew boss vacancies. Um, we are not seeing uh, many candidates, so we don't have a very good selection of folks to choose from there um, that we had pre-pandemic. Um, we've had some challenges with retention. Um, in many cases, some folks go up there, they get their start and they promote to a district, which is great. Um, other times folks decide that that, um, that position is not the best fit for them and, and they move on. Um, so we have had some constant turnover um, that's created some lack of experience and, and some further challenges up there. And then hence results in a lot of the, the impacts to REI that were noted there, but those probably carry over both to reforestation and our fire program as well. And then, um, so that's one issue there. Um, then the second piece to that was back in April of 21, we had an escape and a, a severe assault of two different women from one of those adults in custody working in one of our designated recreation sites. Um, and so with that, uh, there's been multiple program reviews, um, both in the Department of Corrections, the Department of Forestry, um, civil lawsuits, criminal lawsuits, um, which all have essentially closed now. And hence then I think 
Um, like I said, if the group would be interested in a future uh, topic and tour, we could speak to those program reviews and, and get some insights from corrections and things like that. Um, but ultimately, that did result in changes to the program um, in which we uh, we only utilize five AICs into what some of our designated recreation sites. Ultimately, the sites that we're um, directing our public, um, understanding there can be public all, all around the forest. Um, I would say some of that input did come from our forest crew coordinators. They did provide feedback into those reviews. And in many cases, um, having one employee trying to supervise 10 folks in a campground with public and children present uh, created a challenge for them. Um, and that was one piece of um, that program review. There's a lot of other changes that resulted um, out of that. Um, you know, that's kind of a specific operational one related to REI. Um, but how we document our supervision is different uh, all the way to the clothes that the AICs wear, the verbiage on our crummies, uh, the signage that we carry. Those are all some ODF specific changes that were made. Um, Department of Corrections, they've um, altered the way, uh, I guess, the, the system that's used in which, you know, AICs apply to go out to camp. It's not something where folks are mandated. It's a program in which they apply. Um, and uh, the system in which you can qualify to be out there is now different. The filter, I guess I would say, um, is different given that event. Um, Drug testing policies are different. Um, so a lot of changes. We did um, essentially halt the use of the program as a whole um, for about nine weeks. And in many cases, we're likely at the cusp of no longer being able to utilize that as a program. So um, maybe I would say, you know, that is a summary there, Barrett is. Um, but, uh, you know, we could probably spend half a day if we wanted to on a lot of that history there. Yeah, that's, that's really, really uh, enlightening. I mean, um, in describing the process of basically, yeah, basically trying to rescue from the chopping block a program, you know, via program changes, and adaptations. Um, I know, you know, it was pretty valuable for um, staff who were, trained to do so to be able to just roll into camp you know point to three guys and say come with me and go out to the back country and do work um and that's certainly probably uh something that's going to be slow to come back but um that's really helpful any, any questions about the south fork uh kind of labor force for and and maybe if you don't mind, Barrett, before we do that, I'm going to maybe quickly go back to the the recruitment and the retention challenges, and I'm going to ask Jason if he wouldn't mind um, teeing up a video for us. But one thing that we've done there um, is working with our public affairs. They've got some additional capacity, um, and we've been working with our HR department on the challenges that we have. They've developed a recruitment video for us. Um, and so when the job announcements go out, they're essentially constantly out. Um, we've got this video uh, as a link that candidates can click on to try to get an understanding of the position. And we hope that that helps us with recruitment and retention. Um, we did get the, we did qualify for the, a hard to fill classification in state government where there was a one-time financial incentive and that that helped um, so that we're looking at that as well uh, we're looking at these the classification of these positions to see if they're being compensated adequately and that was initiated through uh, the union bargaining process and so that's ongoing currently this year as well and then we're really trying to reach out strategically to the our, our seasonal fire crews, right? I mean, we are an organization that 
um, kind of doubles in size each year. We say we hire seasonals and then we end up laying off our seasonals. And we have many of those who are looking for full-time employment. Um, and while South Fork is unique, um, it is, that is something we can offer that in many cases, other divisions in the agency can't is a full-time position. So we're trying to strategically meet with those firefighters as well. Um, so if the group doesn't mind, and I know sometimes it's a challenge to play a video over Zoom for those folks to be able to hear it. Um, and so maybe if that doesn't work, maybe Jason, you could just put the link in the chat, but um, there's just about a, a two and a half minute video um, that I wouldn't mind playing if the, and then open it up for questions. Force crew coordinator is another um, term for a crew boss that runs a 10-man AIC or another term for an inmate 10-man crew that either does reforestation or recreation work for ODF and they are given tasks and they go out and work every day with that crew. I go up there in the morning, pick up the crew of 10 and we go out and work and I share my knowledge with them and creating uh, good working habits for AICs. They're a pretty good group of guys that are pretty positive. And a lot of them are willing to learn. A lot of them want to get out here. They want to learn these kind of trades, reforestation, recreation, fire. Because then when they are released into the public, then they can take these things that they've learned here and apply them to out in the world. A typical work day is, you know, show up in the morning I mean, get your truck and get your crew and spend the day in the field with your crew working on your project and then usually you're back in at the end of the day, 45 minutes before quitting time to finish up paperwork and so it's a very field orientated position. So with drive time of anywhere from 15 minutes away to two, two and a half hours away. And you get to see a lot of places, a lot of country. First off, you, you gotta like being in the outdoors um, and in, you know, a lot of different kinds of weather. But, uh, you know, the, the scenery and the, and the places you get to hike into and, and you know, just the, your surroundings and, and all that, it's a pretty awesome thing to be part of. That's why I wanted to work here because I knew it was mostly field work and I was jumped on the opportunity. And so, so I like being out in the field. You're going to get leadership skills. You're going to learn leadership. You're going to learn supervisory skills. You're going to learn mentoring because you're going to be mentoring these individuals. If you're interested in forestry, this is one of the best places to learn. You can really gain a lot of hands-on understanding in, in the reforestation and recreation and other things, but um, if, you know, if you're looking to build that in your resume or something, I think this, this place can offer a lot, of, a lot of that. I think just working at ODF is, is has so many opportunities to expand from, you know, and, and this position, in general gives you a, a real wide variety of, of experiences that you can kind of build off of. I'm going to be starting an NRS1 position in Tillamo and having this job and having this position has been able to move me on to that position so and I'm super grateful for South Fork and working here and being able to move on and do that. This job right here gives you the opportunity to actually go work in many different districts, meet multiple people, so you can get that little social network going on and you can see how you run crews. Yeah, so if you're looking for another job in the agency, so you get that experience and it gives you opportunity to maybe apply for other jobs as they open up for those. We have had foremen move on from this and actually went into wildland suit jobs. You get to see the impact you make, um, especially over time, you know, if you put a career in and you know, in 15 years and you're seeing trees that are 20 feet tall, it's like, hey, I planted those. You know, there's a lot of reward there to see the, the end product of your efforts. It's a good opportunity to come out here and learn some, learn some good stuff. <laughs>
you know, you'd mentioned having a, a greater social media presence and we've got some capacity to do some things in public affairs now that I think we haven't had previous. And, um, and so they're focused on some of these pinch points for us to try to help us as well. Yeah, because you can get that out on. I can't blame you for not getting <laughs> good on you for not getting caught up in the drama. Um, <laughs> we typically do publish these on Facebook. I'd have to go back and look and see if we did on this one, but if we didn't, we surely should. Um, and our so we have a recently hired an internal comm specialist who um, produced that video for us. His name is Brian Longoria, and so just wanted to give him a shout out and um, working with HR to. Uh, strategically identify difficult to fill positions and honing in on those. Uh, so expect more to come there. I think um, we're also stepping up our recruiting via LinkedIn and establishing a more active presence there. And uh, we have seen some positive results as, you know, in terms of getting more uh, candidates for positions. So um That's a good thought and a good prompt to make sure we're pushing that out. So thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Department of Credit. I didn't realize that you guys had such a presence there. Yeah. The, you know, overall, so the crew bosses are ODF employees. Um, and then we've got a, a small management team. Um, I, the corrections, uh, org structure is about double hours, you know, they, because they need to staff up there 24 seven, um, throughout the year. Um, but it's the department of forestry that essentially checks those folks out and provides their supervision for the 40 hour work week. Um, and then right. Corrections has the supervision um on the the times that are outside that work week and um it's a model a lot of the western states use and it because it allows us then to train and take them to the fire line um so uh california has had the biggest program um a lot of cal fire has had the aic crews um and i think that's kind of it's based in the firefighting history there Um, when we're talking about maintenance and some of the trail work and stuff around the Tillamook Center, do you have like volunteers? You know, I know we have a lot of where I live, we have a lot of trail volunteer, you know, groups around the area that do trail work and stuff. Do you utilize those at all um, for your trail work and stuff around the center? We do uh, have volunteers that help us with that assistance. Um, and a lot of times it's their availability um, with our operations, but we do have volunteers that do help. We with Oregon Hunters used to um, volunteer there all the time, uh, doing the benches, making the wooden benches. And we made a amphitheater, um, trail work and all kinds of stuff. Not sure why we stopped, but it was fun. You well, also made some beautiful carts for us that are in our gift shop and that uh, are a base for our fish rearing tank. Yeah, that was uh, Alan. He made them for you. Nice. Nice. Any other questions on the, the, the camp, uh, uh, Department of Corrections and the Labor force for okay, great. Uh, and back, back, back to you, Denise. So that's um, what we have to share for our updates right now. Unless Randy would like to add anything else, Randy. 
Uh, no, you did a great job, Denise. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate that video that Don showed. That's the uh, first time I'd seen it. So I think it's a great depiction of, of the benefits uh, for both ODF staff and, and the uh, AICs uh, associated with the work program. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Don, for the, the drill down. Uh, very, very helpful. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Denise, did you intend to have your hand up? Yes. I did. I did. I just wanted to, um, I was sitting here thinking, you know, I, I was on the tour at South Fork. It was a number of years ago now. And just knowing um, how much South Fork has contributed you know, to the work that ODF does. And I, I was just, I was sitting here thinking about, um, you know, staffing problems. And what I, I just wanted to say, um, I think ODF is doing a good job, like recognizing both the scope of the challenge um, and the impacts that it's having on recreation. And um, Denise, while you were speaking, I thought, Man, recreation always just seems to have such a challenge. You know, if it's not one thing, it's another. You know, COVID, funding um, before COVID, and now South Fork. And um, yeah, so as an SFAC member, I think I just wanted to say that that I, you know, um, I see what a challenge it is to make it function well. Um, given the, the the constraints that are there. And then I also wanted to say, it really sounds like the department is really trying to do kind of um, like problem solving in a way that's very uh, cohesive and like wrapping around this problem. And so for, as someone who's on the outside looking like what you just described in terms of all the things that you're trying to do to get more staff, to help with retention, um, I just wanted to say good job, like way to really be strategic about that. And um, I hope that things like the video and um, increases in pay and things like that help you guys kind of get more people on board so so that self work can be functioning um, more fully. I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Great, thanks, Denise. Well, um, if there's nothing else for the REI team, we'll let them go and say thank you. Thanks for the uh, information. Do we see? Go ahead, Ron. Well, I think we're here, so we probably finished before yeah, noon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll just go till we're done. Yeah. yeah well, we can. That's true. So we'll just kind of keep working until uh, our, uh, our our meal shows up. I guess um, in the agenda we. We have a section here for future meeting topics. And um, I think right up front, we have uh, membership terms um, to discuss. And um, one of those topics, I guess, before we get into the individual members is uh, the fact that this will be my last meeting as chair, um, handing off to um, who has been serving as uh, vice chair, Denise, will now take uh, the role as chair from after this meeting. So thank you, for Denise, Denise for uh, signing up a year ago or so. Um, and that means, um, pardon me while I wipe a tear, um, I'll be uh, relieved of this the, the job. And we need to, uh, as a committee, discuss you know, who would like to serve in that um, on deck role as vice chair. Um, so we'd be basically electing uh, a chair for two years from now. So um, in the past, we take, we had taken nominations from the floor, um, but you know, any other input on that from the committee be, be great. Um, time to think about a little bit. Barrett, could I just, Miss Denise, could I just say a couple things? Sure thing. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership. Um, yeah. You've done a wonderful job as chair, um, and it's been a pleasure serving as vice chair with you. And um, we will miss you as chair, but you're still staying on the committee. So that's very good. Um, 
And second of all, I just wanted to say to my fellow SVAC members um, that, that serving in the position of vice chair and, and then we'll see what happens with chair um, has really been, um, I, I'm saying this is kind of a small ad. It's been really, it's been uh, really useful for me to be more engaged in helping to set the agendas, um, having conversations with Andy and Ron um, about, you know, what's coming next and kind of um, setting kind of what the uh, committee is going to be looking at. And so if there's anyone who's even slightly interested, I would say definitely toss your name in the ring because I've, I've found it to be um, useful and informative and, and enjoyable. Thanks. Yeah. yeah I, if I, I, I should have said, uh, we really encourage folks to nominate themselves from the floor. I mean, don't wait to be nominated. If you're interested at all, just please, please speak up. We'd, we'd love your help. What we could do also is just uh, <clears throat> stew on that question over lunch. Give us some time to lobby too. But, um, any thoughts, Ron? Well, yeah, I just would like to also thank you, Barrett, for the you know commitment that you've had you know to the committee for a long time, um, a very long time, and the the leadership you've provided to this committee in multiple capacities, as well as the commitment you provide to the agency in a variety of uh, ways that you support our agency work. So um, look to have you driving a, a white rig one day. I mean, when you're pulling up here, <laughs> you're, you're all in on a lot of our work and we really appreciate that, that support and involvement you've had for, for many, many years, well over a decade. So thank you very much you know, for that. And look forward to working with Denise and whoever uh, else steps up to assist in the organization and leadership of this, this committee as we go forward. Uh, April, I was going to ask you, you know, typically we have um, taken nominations and then done like a email ballot kind of thing, right? Could you refresh me on that? <laughs> yeah, we, we did do the ballots via um, email one time and then we discovered that we have to do them in the meeting in a formal format. Great, but we could take nominations today. We don't necessarily, we're missing several members is one thing that was on my mind. Mm -hmm. So we, we could maybe, um, you know, we'll have a chair for sure, right? Ne next meeting. <laughs> yeah, so we could but maybe we could put it out there We could also opt to um, have a very brief virtual meeting to do the elections formally that way versus in person. Okay. We can't do it. We have to just do it in an open forum and that would suffice. Right. Well, we could solicit nominations yes. via email and then based on the pool of, of nominees, we could then meet to have an oral. Well, we but, didn't uh, instruct not to reply all. With the nomination, we reply individually. I think we stay out of trouble. <clears throat> like we, as long as you don't rep reply, be careful not to reply. Jason's, Jason's going to set us straight yeah, like here. For Jason, for so one option could be that um, between now and the next meeting, we um, kind of have on the agenda chair and vice chair elections. Let people know that's coming up, and um, you know, in lieu of nominations through email, um, you could consider just kind of thinking about who. If you want to, if you if you yourself are interested in one of these roles, or if you know someone who is, um, you can let that person know individually. As to, to your point of not replying all, um, and you could also just kind of save that for the meeting as well. Um, is a is another option, but I think the not replying all is is generally good guidance on that sort of thing. I guess I'd go to, you know, Denise, if you're comfortable with, you know, go ahead and working with, you know, Andy and I to, you know, work on the agenda for the next meeting with you. And then at that meeting, have the you know, vote for 
a vice chair with people thinking about it in between now and then, or we could certainly do some type of special meeting. But if you're comfortable with that, that might work. I'm comfortable with that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah great. Okay. <clears throat> um, so as for terms, um, I my term expires um, here this December. Um, and I'd be willing to continue if um, uh, the team will would like to uh, approve me. I'll I'll be willing to continue. Uh, the next uh, name we've got actually is Denise, but um, you're stuck. Regardless, so it doesn't matter what you what you want. Uh, so you'll serve uh, that uh, two year term as chair, and then. Uh, uh, Tom Scoggins is um, up, and um, so we'll reach out to him to uh, inquire if he's interested in extending, or um, and uh, he is a uh, listed as a liaison member, or um, as a retired ODF person. Um, so we'll next meeting we'll have more information about his status and um, can you, do you have a, a Ron, do you have current uh, awareness of uh, the selection review process that, that evolved and I don't remember. Yeah, so that. for for members that are uh, wishing to continue on, that's discretionary to the co-conveners with, with Andy and I, and then, um, you know, with recruitments for new members, we want to try and, you know, balance out the existing membership that we have and assess, you know, what uh, interests we have and various user groups we have on the committee. Um, we do have one member that's not showing up on the sheet you're looking at, Chris oh. Inquist's position, that was a, an unaffiliated uh, position. We have that vacancy still, and we're going to continue to. Um, consider that as well. We were looking, you know, looking ahead with the committee in general, as we reflect back on the policy update that we had with the forest management plan and, and the HCP, um, you know, when that policy work for the forest management plan is, is concluded, we will need to reassess the charter for the committee because it's currently structured as providing us advice for implementation of the Northwest forest management plan. And when we adopt the Western Oregon State Forest Management Plan and broaden the geographic scope of that planning area, we're gonna to need to consider the committee representation, I think, within the context of that planning area as well. So that's something Andy and I have kicked around too with that um, unaffiliated member, you know, possibly looking for someone further south. Um, so that's just- I was gonna say the same thing, somebody in Western Oregon. Yeah, <laughs> just to get some broader geographic representations, we expand that. So that's a, it's, a good, it's going to evolve over the coming, you know, over in 2023 collectively. Yeah, great. And then the review of new members, um, the vetting of uh, membership. How, uh, what's the. Yeah, there's an application process for new members that we would solicit for. And then the applications would be reviewed by Andy and I, and then Andy has also, re, you know, relied on one other external, um, you know, party as well. And we'll just have to assess that as we get closer. But Andy and I would be the ones um, currently to do that. Right. All right. Thanks. Um, so for as for um, future. Um, we do want to talk about future topics um, for, and then we also had um, a question pop up kind of in this future topic zone. We, at one time we were trying to promote um, space in SVAC meetings for individual members to do kind of uh, either working lunch or around midday presentations about their, their areas of, uh, uh, expertise, or you know how they uh, come to this this role. Um, there, we've had some pretty interesting presentations that have been off the wall, just to, but uh, edifying for the committee. Uh, whether it's been uh, watershed work or recreation um, engagement, 
Yeah, yeah. And so um, we just kind of let that slip, I think, from our planning. And I don't know if that's because we sense that uh, there was, uh, it was just work that committee members didn't want to, extra work they didn't want to do, or maybe we just stopped from promoting it. So um, I just, on the way out the door, would like to encourage us to uh, try and keep that on the agenda. I think it's it's great to get to know members and to get to know more about what they know. So uh, let's uh, open the floor for, for discussion of uh, future meeting topics. Um, I don't think we've done any development work on dates, have we? You do? No. No, we can't. No, we don't. But we so can. Typically, we have um, an April meeting. Last year was the eighth. We had a half day Zoom meeting. We were still in, in all virtual in April. So we had been having. Absolutely. Susan, we can, we can schedule those dates and get them out to folks here in the next week. Great. And uh, with. Um, uh, and I toward the comments about trying to do get the whole year done at that time and uh, great. Well, one question related to the the venue, um, possibly moving back. I mean, we're we're here in Salem. You know, you're coming from Oak Ridge, and you know, is this, is this venue working for the in person option? Does the Salem venue work? Dan's got a question there. Oh, you're on mute, Dan. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just raised my hand for future. If you wanted to answer that, I was, I, I was just, I'm curious as the new person, and I want to be respectful of this committee's rules and all of that stuff. But what kind of topics are you looking for for future meetings? Well, there, in, the intention of the committee is to advise us on the implementation of our forest management plan. So we strive to keep you informed of current events, policy work that could inform you know, future implementation. Like for instance, we're gonna be having our draft implementation plans. The revised implementation plans are gonna be out for public comment um, you know, prior to that meeting, but they will be out for public comment. We'll be having annual operations plans is typically a topic for the spring meeting in that once those revisions to the implementation plans are approved, the fiscal 24 annual operation plans that you know relate to those revised implementation plans will be will likely be out for public comment during that time of the meeting. So how are we transitioning the walk operationally and implementation between the, the two policy worlds, you know, is uh, probably the most important thing we'll be dealing with at that time. Yeah related to actual implementation, but then there could be other things related to budgets and staffing uh, that are you know, going on. Legislature will be in session of a new governor. Um, funding is always, uh, you know, what's the economy doing? How does it relate to us, the timber market, et cetera? Yeah, yeah maybe what, um, you, you, we can certainly do this by submission via email to uh, Andy and Ron and, uh, the um, occasionally what's been helpful is, you know, having the department um, keep us informed about, you know, points of controversy or, or uh, kind of focus our attention on the gray areas that are not prescribed and planned, you know, try and forecast um, decision space that's on the horizon where there, you know, the department has, finds themselves with latitude, you know, within which to work and, um, maybe um, you can uh, kind of spur thoughts about agenda topics by trying to forecast what's what's coming in the gray zone space or the con controversy space. Um, and I was going to say Susan? too, if you, I know I'm the farthest south, but we've done the meetings at Forest Grove and I was able to make it there. So <laughs> it's a little bit of a, you know, yeah, loopy thing to get up there. But, you know, if that's closer for other people, I can do it. I like, I like that community center myself, but I'm, I'm really local. So 
May I suggest this as a recommendation and take it how you like, and especially since you mentioned Boris Grow, I was going to mean, mention this, um, you know, Emerald Ash Borer is in Oregon and Forest Grove is the epicenter. And if we're going to meet there, I mean, maybe Christine Buell or someone can come and update this group about what that's about, if that's if that's valuable. Um, we're doing a lot of work on that in prep. Yeah, thanks for that, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I see your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute, Greg. Sorry, um, I'm not saying anything new, but I think it's a great idea if we have, say, four meetings, big meetings a year, maybe two of them in Salem and the other two, Forest Grove or bury them and so that they're not all in Salem. You know, it's a bit of a tangent, but uh, what's the department know about uh, ash on state forest? Um, not, I mean, uh, silviculturally, not a big question, but it, from a repairing standpoint, there are places that can be. Yeah, big, we, we don't have a lot on state forests. Um, Stephanie may be able to speak to some of this, you know, in the, in the Willamette Valley, there's just a little, little bit there. And also, yeah, yeah. And maybe, you know, even in, in West Oregon, I don't think we have really anything significant there. Um, it generally doesn't affect the forested uplands um, that we have in state in the state forests ownership. So there are some. I'm not saying there aren't any, but it's it's not a huge element of our our forest uh, species out there. Yeah. Great. Thanks. We have been um, using outside funding to fund some of our employees to go and collect ash seed in certain populations. Our reforestation team has been working on that. All right, um, uh, Susan. Well, I just remember there was some thought at one point about uh, maybe something at Tillamook, since that's kind of a big area, Tillamook or closer to Astoria. I could drag my husband and <laughs> do a, a mini vacation, a field trip. <laughs> yep. And we have have done both. Uh, Astoria was a good location for a meeting and tour once. Um, and uh, Tillamook, I'm not sure if, we've never stayed in Tillamook that I recall, but um, uh. Hey Barrett, this is Mike McKibben. Sure, Mike. Uh, just a thought, you know, in light of the HCP and uh, the new forest management plan, um, I was thinking maybe a good topic for conversation or maybe a guest speaker um, on the on the one one of the upcoming agendas could be to to have somebody from the community, maybe a county commissioner come into our meeting and discuss with our group potential implications of the HCP on how it might affect them. I know those have been uh, some discussions that have happened. Um, with the Board of Forestry, but I'm not sure everybody on HVAC completely understands that. Um, just just a thought. Yeah, it's a great, that's a, that's a, it's a good idea. It'll be significant in some ways and um, okay, well, uh, we must we must have sandwiches uh, out there. April, do you know if we? Okay. We're pretty much done though. Yeah. So I mean, if you want to. Yeah, you but uh, thoughts there before huh. we close down because there's no there's no more afternoon. That's, that's right. This is Ron here. Yeah, we've uh, you know we had a lot of time in the morning allocated to sort of recap the tour. So I just reportioned the agenda items out there, and I knew I had space. You know, between them, wasn't sure how long it was going to take and how many questions, etc. There would be, but we're essentially finished with the business meeting agenda. So there's no need to reconvene after lunch, Chair okay. Brown. Okay. Um, but if you had any other closing business or just comments, uh, I think we're concluded with the, the business agenda. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, 
Yeah, but all I have is uh, kind of for uh, action required or action encouraged <laughs> is for committee members to uh, um, kind of uh, send in uh, feedback about um, meeting uh, topics to uh, consider if you'd be willing to, or willing to either make a nomination or nominate yourself for vice chair, please uh, keep that in the corner of your mind. And then uh, April's gonna um, send out um, some prompts for um, our meeting schedule for next year. So um, please, please help by being re as responsive as possible and see if we can get, get things pinned down early. So um, thank you uh, for, uh, the kind words, Ron and, um, and Denise. Uh, it's been a been a pleasure working with everybody. So um, look forward to joining as a committee member alone. Will, without any other comments for the good of the order, anybody? Uh, Lisa, go ahead. I just want to thank you, um, Barrett. Uh, I know this is a it, it's a tough job, and I know you were coming in not only while we were remote, but also then straddling the hybrid options. And so I just really appreciate you taking us through the, I can't believe it's already been two years. I, that just astounds me. So um, anyway, thank you for the great job you did and very much appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, thanks, but before anybody else jumps in, I should adjourn this thing. Um, <laughs> anything else for the good of the order, I uh, will. We'll call it uh, call it a meeting. Thank you, everybody, for your attention, and um, I look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks, Barrett. Yep. Thanks, Barrett. yep. Thank you.